first item on the agenda is to adopt our agenda. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, next item is item C, approval of the January 26th, right, 2017 minutes. Isn't that what they are? January 12th. January 12th? Oh, should we're doing both? Should be item C, you should have a deferred, sorry, a revised agenda. Got, yes. I thought that was a mistake, I'm sorry. January 12th. The minutes of January 12, 2017. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Great. Uh, next item is the recognition of council members. And I think we have quite a few here tonight. Um, so we'll call you. And if you want to come up and speak now, you're welcome to. Or if you want to wait and speak with your item later this evening, um, that is fine as well. Um, Councilman Swope? I'll wait. You'll wait? Okay. Uh, Hager. I just got uh, item 25. It's on the consent agenda. This used to be zone CS, and somehow I got zone CL. It's uh, and these gentlemen are wanting just to put it to a CSA, and it's on the consent agenda, and I'm fine with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, Councilman Davis. I saw you earlier. She's not yeah, here now. Yeah. Um, Councilman Cooper. Okay. Um, Council Lady Roberts. Okay. Do you want to speak now or wait with your item? Okay. Okay. Is her item deferred? Is it on the deferral list? Is on the deferral list. Item five. We have moved item five to the deferral list. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It is, yes, Council Lady, it is on the, the deferral. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Council Lady Van Rees. Hi. Hi. It's getting cold and it's going to be beautiful tomorrow, so welcome to Nashville. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I am Nancy Van Rees. I'm the Councilwoman in District 8. I uh, just wanted to bring to your attention item number 14, which um, has a staff recommendation for approval. I believe it's still on consent, but I wanted the chance to be able to say how amazing this entire process has been for the East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Uh, it's one of those moments to where we're going to be able to tell our grandchildren that this was something that got started here today. And so I wanted to pause for a moment and give it some room to, to breathe instead of it just kind of flying through. The uh, staff was on overtime trying to get as much detail and working with so many amazing uh, developers on this plan. And uh, the report that they gave is probably one of the most thorough things I've ever seen. And so I wanted to speak on, on my behalf for their due diligence and making sure that this was thoroughly vetted. Um, the developers that are involved are all local guys and girls that are excited about making sure that uh, the history of this area of East Nashville has a chance to thrive. And so on behalf of the folks at District 8 who have attended, I think, close to half a dozen community meetings in regard to this plan already, uh, we offer our full support. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our staff. Um, any other council members that we've missed? Well, up. Oh, pulley. Pulley. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so our next item is item E, which is an update on the in motion plan. Good afternoon, I'm Michael Briggs, uh, the transportation planner in the planning department. Um, and I'm gonna briefly talk about um, how our plans are interconnected together. Um, and so this graphic um, shows the relationship between the different transportation plans and how they relate to the Nashville Next General Plan. Um, and 
what I want you to keep in mind um, is that as we update one plan, we should reflect back on all of the other modal plans um, so that we coordinate a more complete transportation system. And you'll recall that uh, the Planning Commission adopted Volume 5 of Nashville Next um, called Access Nashville 2040, which functions as the city's transportation plan. Um, and we regularly update the major and collector street plan, which outlines right-of-way needs and street character tied to our community plan policies. And as part of the amendments uh, to Nashville Next this summer, uh, we will ask you to incorporate the updated modal plans uh, that are being coordinated by the other metro departments. Um, there will also be proposed changes based on those modal plans to the major and collector street plan to help tie all of these transportation plans together. And so today we'll have an overview of the in motion uh, transit plan and that was completed by MTA last year. And then at our first meeting in March, we'll have an overview of the walk and bike plan, which is um, already out um, in a draft for the public to review and comment on. And then finally, the plan to play uh, plan which incorporates greenways, which have a significant transportation component, uh, will be released by Parks uh, later this month. And we'll have a presentation from them before uh, this summer as well. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Felix Castradad, who is the director of MTA to go over the in motion plan. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, members of the Planning Commission, and thank you for having me here today. Again, my name is Felix Castro, I'm Director of Planning of MTA. And I just wanted to bring an update uh, on where we are with the in motion plan and some of the next steps as we move forward with the plan. Um, the plan was adopted by the MTA board back in September 2016, and we went through a very extensive uh, process in developing this plan that took almost two years. It came in the dovetail of Nashville Next, which was a good thing because it allowed us to use the recommendations from Nashville Next and all the information that was collected through that and be able to implement that in the process uh, as we put this plan together. So uh, that, that was very helpful in that sense, but we went through several different phases of the plan, trying to understand what the people's preferences and desires were for transit, uh, to development of improvement strategies based on other places and what they've done. Uh, best practices, if you will. Uh, and we developed three different scenarios that we uh, presented to the public to, to look at what the possibilities well were and evaluated those scenarios with, for recommendations. Uh, the, the focus of the plan is to how to improve the transit system in the next uh, 25 years uh, and make it a meaningful tool to address the growth that we are experiencing and improve the mobility in Nashville and the region. Uh, this was very heavy on the community involvement, uh, and again, we uh, learned a lot from the Nashville Next process. So we set a goal of 10,000 engagements at the beginning of the process, and we uh, pretty much doubled that, which was a very good thing. Uh, very daunting process in the same time, but uh, very meaningful uh, feedback that we were able to collect through that, through that process. Uh, in general, uh, what we heard about the plan was a general approval. Uh, uh, of course, everybody had a different opinion on how to implement all the different uh, recommendations, uh, but in the end, uh, everybody thought that it was needed. Uh, there's a desire to see things happening faster than just 25 years. Uh, there's a sense of urgency, a uh, feeling that we've been falling behind, especially compared to other uh, of our peer regions. Uh, there's a desire, especially from the current riders, to improve the existing service as it is before we uh, put a lot of emphasis on creating uh, big capital improvements for the plan. There's a desire to see more rail options. Uh, there's a, a common, I guess, acknowledgement that the rail can be a bit uh, more dependable than buses. Buses get stuck in traffic. There's uh, uh, some thoughts about that. There were some concerns about the general cost, uh, but again, we're talking about uh, heavy investment, especially in rail, over 25 years. Uh, so yes, there's gonna be a, a costly component to it. Uh, and then uh, technology integration, making sure that we are addressing some of the new models when it comes to mobility, like uh, ride sharing, uh, ride sourcing, the, the Lyft and the Ubers, for example, and new technologies that are emerging like autonomous uh, or uh, automated vehicles. Now, uh, going into this process, we had some goals that we had uh, set for the process. And of course, at the core that we have, everything we do with transit, we have to make sure that we provide opportunities for uh, mobility and uh, availability for the people that don't have uh, automobiles. Uh, so that access to a greater opportunity was one of the main goal, our main goals. Uh, 
uh, make sure that we develop opportunities uh, or uh, options that are competitive, especially with the uh, automobile uh, for all Middle Tennesseans. Uh, simplify and integrate the means of transportation, make it a true transportation network and making sure that no single solution is gonna help the problems that we are experiencing in Middle Tennessee. We're not saying that um, transit is the only solution for Nashville uh, problems, but it could be a very meaningful tool if used correctly. Uh, prioritize the majority of the transit invest investments in transit supportive areas. So uh, as, as we work through this process, we need to concentrate in areas that are willing to look at uh, the policies that are gonna allow for transit to thrive better. And that includes uh, higher densities and, and uh, making sure that uh, there's a willingness there to uh, provide that infrastructure and policies that would allow for that. And also uh, make sure that we put our uh, emphasis on where we're gonna have uh, more bang for the buck, uh, where the ridership is, where the corridors where we're seeing the, the uh, most congestion happening as well. So, uh, so we had some assumptions as, at the same time. Uh, one of them is to grow with intention, making sure that we're not start, starting this from uh, scratch. So we um, uh, made sure to pay a lot of attention to Nashville Next, the recommendations, also the MPO's uh, 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, acknowledging that the role of downtown is gonna be critical. Uh, it, it remains a, a major focus in Middle Tennessee. We have a lot of service that goes through downtown and this is one of the areas where a majority of our uh, service gets bucks down. Um, making sure that uh, we put an emphasis and we focus on short term improvements that can be meaningful and, and can provide some relief in the short term. Uh, make it a comprehensive effort. So uh, when we look at what improvements we propose, not just saying this is a transit line, but this is a, a transformative project that is gonna help with the corridor as a whole, not just the transit, but sidewalks, improvements to uh, crossings, for example, lighting, uh, 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 furnishings, uh, streets, uh, streetscaping, and things of that nature, rather than just a transit improvement, but something, something that can benefit the corridor as a, as a whole. Partnerships and collaboration, uh, we provide uh, transit service, but there's a lot of things that are, are outside of uh, the MTA control. So to making sure that we have those partnerships with other agencies in the state, regional, local level, federal level is gonna be key as we move forward. And maximum flexibility, uh, the plan needs to be resilient enough to be able to evolve as the circumstances change. Uh, the political will changes and different things change through the process, so the plan needs to be able to adapt as such. With that, uh, seven main strategies were identified in the plan in order to start improvements in the process, and you can see those listed here. To make the service easier to use, improve the existing services. Accessibility, accessibility to transit was a, a main uh, theme that we kept hearing through the process. Making the service more comfortable, develop network, uh, network of regional transit centers outside of downtown. Expand the service to areas where we have gaps. Uh, or new areas and uh, build high capacity uh, or rapid s service network. I just wanna touch on some of these real quick, just to give you an example of what we mean by those. The plan uh, recommended simplifying the service, making the, the service, uh, you know, more streamlining the service wherever we have routes that are too cumbersome, making sure that we are targeting the, the markets that we need to target uh, in servicing the the main people that needs to be served and making it efficient at the same time, improving the information, simplifying fair payment system, not uh, just to be able to adopt some of the new technologies and um, like uh, mobile ticketing and so on, smart technology uh, and using uh, uh, other private sector companies, for example, as we improve the first and last mile and that's the way in, in, in which a uh, uh, rider gets to the bus stop and how they continue to their final destination once they get out of the transit vehicle. Improving the existing service, uh, making sure that we make it more frequent. Uh, it's not frequent enough as it is right now. Uh, it's one of the main criticisms that we keep hearing. Uh, it doesn't operate for longer hours of the day, so it makes it very difficult for uh, people that work late shifts, for example. We can get them there, we cannot bring them back home. Uh, and as we continue to grow, as Nashville uh, continues to provide more services, this is gonna be uh, critical. Uh, downtown, as I mentioned, the plan conceptualizes uh, what we call uh, you know, some transit emphasis corridors in downtown. Uh, and this is just, uh, again, a conceptual look at what it could look like. 
Um, and, and these uh, recommendations are part of the plan is something that it's been passed along to the city as they keep working on, on downtown mobility as well. Cross town and through uh, city routes, our system is a hop and spoke, so a lot of the trips have to come to downtown, and many, it makes it very difficult because people, for example, if you're coming on from any up, you have to get downtown if you're gonna go to uh, down on West End and then transfer to another bus and then go down West End. Uh, the plan looks at opportunities to develop cross town routes that allow for uh, better connections without having to go to downtown. And also, uh, it looks at the possibility of making uh, routes go through downtown rather than so you don't have to get off the bus. Maybe the bus that comes from the northeast becomes the, go, the bus that goes to the, to the west part of town, for example. Uh, improving access to transit is just something that uh, we've, uh, we've been trying to get into um, a better conversation and relationship as it comes with public works and pal planning department at the, at the same time. Um, we heard a lot about how difficult or how unsafe it was to access transit facilities but because of the lack of sidewalks, because of uh, very dangerous uh, intersections that they need to be crossed to get to, to the bus stops. Making sure that we uh, address those, making the connections to transit better, uh, addressing the first and last mile and the convenience of bringing different modes and connecting to other modes at the same time. Make service more comfortable, uh, more and better station and stops, and more comfortable vehicles. I mean, it is that will attract uh, riders and also make it better for the existing riders. Um, regional transit centers outside of downtown, and this will be a smaller footprint in key areas where would allow for, to, for the riders to have a, an easier way to transfer to uh, different buses or different routes but at the same time allowing for a connectivity to other modes, uh, places where you can have bike lockers or you can have maybe uh, bike sharing uh, or you can have a, a place where you can wait for your, uh, Uber or Lyft to continue to your trip or to get to your uh, bus stop and, and finish your, your trip using transit. And expand service to new areas. Again, the plan doesn't only look at Nashville, it looks at, Na at the Middle Tennessee region as, uh, as a complete region. So there's several uh, uh, recommendations that, that look at improving the connection to other parts of the region, um, especially in the you know, next 25 years. Again, the last area of emphasis on the plan is to look at uh, high capacity transit, more robust service, uh, premium transit, if you will, and different modes that will serve to complement uh, the different um, modes in the net in the transportation network. For Nashville specifically, the plan proposes uh, or look at the possibility of four light rail lines, um, and those are along the Murfreesboro, Nolensville, Charlotte, and Gallatin Pike corridors. It looks at bus rapid transit um, and Dickerson Pike. And uh, that's what we call full bus rapid transit, which is very similar to light rail with dedicated lanes for buses. Uh, and also arterial bus rapid transit along Hillsborough Road and West End, and that's uh, uh, skip stop and, and service with buses that will run on, on lanes that would not be dedicated for buses necessarily spe or specifically. And also rapid bus, this is, um, if you're familiar with our um, uh, BRT light, this is a kind of a step above, it's branded service with, with very frequent service and uh, skip stop that w operates for uh, all, you know, all day long, for uh, long hours of the day and with uh, about 15 minutes or better frequencies. And then at the regional level, uh, Beyond the light rail and the bus rapid transit, it also looks at commuter rail between Nashville and Clarksville. It looks at improving the Music City Star Line between Nashville and Lebanon uh, with newer equipment, better service, uh, they, you know, all week long service, as well as the possibility of double tracking the line. And then uh, bus rapid transit on the freeway and dedicated lanes along some of the major interstates as well as rapid transit connecting uh, the different areas in, in, in Middle Tennessee. Now when it comes to the cost, these are $2015, of course, over a 25 year period with uh, consideration for heavy investment on, on capital, uh, capital infrastructure for rail. Uh, so uh, the overall capital cost, it's about $6 billion over a 25 year period. The annual operating cost will be uh, $338 million. That's for both RTA and MTA service. Uh, the funding is still you know, being uh, looked at. The uh, 
if you were listening, you saw that the governor made an announcement uh, very recently about the gas tax increase and the opportunity for a, uh, a local option for, for the local governments for transit. Uh, so that could be uh, an opportunity to, to look at some of these improvements. Uh, but the, certain, the reality is that this is going to require a lot more than just local funding. It's going to require uh, states, it's going to require federal funds, and uh, the way to pursue different uh, op options as it comes to funding. Um, the total capital costs for MTA and RTA, as well as operating, you can see the differences there. But uh, at the very end, it comes to a per capita cost of $249. Uh, and right now, for what we have in service today, it's about $68. Uh, per capita. What are the next steps? Um, things that we have control over, MTA, RTA. We are working on more frequent service for longer hours. Uh, we are preparing to uh, put in our metro budget request um, some uh, monies for frequent ser more frequent service, longer hours of, of operation. We are working on what we call, we call a comprehensive operational analysis. This is uh, an analysis that is going to help us to identify the weaknesses and the strengths of our current routes. And it's going to help us um, see where uh, we can make it more efficient uh, and where you know, we can make improvements to increase ridership as well. Um, we're also going to be having uh, what we call an origin destination survey uh, in the spring, where we're going to survey our riders to understand their travel patterns and travel behaviors. That is going to give us a lot of information about how they travel, how they use the system, but also to collect uh, very detailed demographic information to understand what our markets are uh, and be able to serve them better. We're also working on a, right now we have a consultant that is helping us with a system technology uh, analysis and how we can improve our uh, fare boxes and um, payment systems, including uh, going to a smart card and as well as uh, mobile ticketing. And also we have, uh, uh, we're going to start later this year, uh, unified branding between MTA and RTA uh, and make it more recognizable, more uh, uh, friendly for people to use the system and understand it. But also things that are beyond our control, uh, the additional service hours and frequency, of course, uh, we're going to need some additional funding for that. That's what we're working on. We keep working on better opportunities to partner for the location of transit centers and park and rides and shelters. We're working very closely with planning and public works on the sidewalk, I'm sorry, on, on ways that we can bring transit into the conversation as development keeps occurring. So uh, we can provide better feedback, especially as it comes to accessibility to our um, facilities. We are taking the first steps toward uh, identifying what is the desire for those high capacity transit modes on, on those major corridors. People spoke a lot about ha wanting to see those things happening. We're going back to the public and saying, okay, so this is what we heard, help us understand what this means. Is this something that you would like to see and how do you want to see it uh, as it develops in, in these corridors? But at the same time, this is not just a transit solution, but it's got to be something that's got to be comprehensive uh, for, for the corridor mobility. And, uh, and, and again, we're participating with Public Works uh, as they work on the downtown mobility study. And real quick, as I mentioned, the, the high capacity transit corridor study, uh, these are the main corridors that were identified of that. So this is where we're going to go out pretty soon to the public. We're ready to have a press release on that. Uh, and we just want to have a, a very detailed conversation with the public. Uh, in the very end, this is not looking at designing anything at this point, but we want to understand what the main concerns are. If any of these corridors are to indeed move with anything in the future, we want to have that conversation early on before um, we got too late into the process uh, um, that, you know, uh, things may not be uh, at the right moment, I guess. So uh, I believe that's, that's the end. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any at this point. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, any questions before we let them go? OK. Thank well, you. Thank Look you. forward to working with you. OK. So the next item is the items for deferral or withdrawal. Yes, we have several items for deferral, starting with item number two. 
This is case number 2016 SP-077-001. This is a request to rezone from R6 to SP zoning on property located at 1021 Elvira Avenue to permit up to six residential units. And the staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item number five, case 2017 SP-007-001. This is a request to rezone from R8 to SP zoning on properties located at, at 6015 and 6017 O'Brien Avenue um, to permit up to nine residential units. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 10, case 2017 S-010-001. This is a request for a, a subdivision amendment approval to amend uh, subdivisions notes seven and eight on the property located at 5959 Edmondson Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Next item on the deferral list is item 11, case 2017 S-012-001. This is a request for final plat approval to create three lots on property located at 1227 Old Hickory Boulevard, and this is in uh, Council District 3. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 13A, case 66-84P-002. This is a request to cancel a portion of a planned unit development overlay district on property located at Old Hickory Boulevard, and this is in uh, Council Lady Mina Johnson's district. And staff recommendation is to defer to the March 9th Planning Commission meeting. The associated case is 13B, case 2017 SP-017-001. This is a request to rezone from R20 and RM4 to SP zoning on property located at Old Hickory Boulevard uh, to permit residential uses and include environmentally sensitive design standards within the SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 15, case 2008 SP-015-002. This is a request to amend an existing SP district on property located at 2400 Fairfax Avenue to permit overflow parking and improvements to an athletic field. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Next item is item 16. Case 2017 SP-005-001. This, this is a request to rezone from NUN to SP zoning and for final site plan approval on property located at 1235 Fifth Avenue North to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 9th Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 18, case 2017 SP-012-001. This is a request to rezone from R15 to SP zoning on property located at 730 Old Hickory Boulevard to permit up to 56 residential units. And this is in Council District 22. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd uh, Planning Commission meeting. Next item is item 19, case 2017 SP-019-001. A, this is a request to rezone from AR2A to SP zoning on property located at 3461 Hamilton Church Road to permit 158 residential units. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. And the last item on the deferral list is item 20, case 2016 S-253-001. This is a request for final plat approval to create two lots and for a variance from the subdivision regulations for sidewalk requirements on property at 1601 Jones Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer to the February 23rd Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, Bob. Can we um, go back through the list just to make sure we all have them? Sure. Items two. Item two. Five. Item five, 10, 11, 13A, 13B, 15, 16, 18, 19, and 20. Okay. Commissioners, do I have a motion? Could I make a statement about one and then yes. go ahead and defer it on item 15, which is in my district. That is a, um, a field behind the Martin Professional Development Center. We had a great community meeting, um, and it was decided that we do want the work on the field to proceed, but not the 
part of the specific plan that would deal with planning with uh, with parking that will happen a year from now when we've seen how the field is used. So I just want to make sure people are aware that we are deferring the SP indefinitely, but the work on the field will happen. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, thanks. Okay. Nope. Um, we are now on to item G, which is the consent agenda. Yes, and before I get to the consent agenda, as information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the de decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. And as notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless an, a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. So as I read the following items into the record, please raise your hand if you'd like one of these items removed from the, from the consent agenda. Starting with item number nine, uh, case 2017-S-S, 009-001. This is a request for final plat approval to shift lot lines and remove a reserve status on properties located on Perimeter Hill Drive and Antioch Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next item is item 14, case 2016 CP-005-005. This is a request to amend the East Nashville Community Plan by adding a special policy area, allowing trail-oriented development, and by changing T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving Policy at key nodes uh, to T3 Suburban Neighborhood Center Policy on various properties located west of Ellington Parkway. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 17, case 2017 SP-006-001. This is a request to rezone from R6 to SP zoning on properties located on Scoville Street to permit 26 residential units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Next item is item 21, case 2017 S-038-001. This is a request for concept plan approval to, to create uh, up to 120 lots on property located at 12444 Old Hickory Boulevard. This is in Councilman Coleman's district. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next item is item 22, case 2014 UD-001-007. This is a request for modification to the, the garage location and setback standards of the Clayton Avenue Urban Design Overlay District to permit an attached garage accessed from the front facade of the principal structure on property located at 905 Clayton Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Next item is item, item 23, case 2017 DTC-002-001. This is a request for a modification of the overall building height for property bounded by Joe Johnston Avenue to the north, uh, railroad right of way to the east, Nelson, Ma Nelson Mary Street to the south, and 11th Avenue North to the west <laughs> to permit a 10-story mixed-use development at a elevation of 570 feet where seven stories is permitted by right, and 10 stories below 560, uh, below a 560 foot elevation is by the by right bonus height maximum. So staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. And next item is item 25. 2017Z-015PR-001. This is a request to rezone from CL to CSA zoning on property located at, on Old Hickory Boulevard. This is in Councilman Larry Hager's district. Staff recommendation is to approve. Next item is item 26, case uh, 2017Z-019PR-001. This is a request to rezone from IR to MUN zoning on property located at 1323 3rd Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. And under, under other business, item 27 is 
to accept a grant of $1,184,684 from the TDOT Federal Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Program to the Planning Department for fiscal years 18 through 20 to support uh, Nashville Complete Trips, a transportation demand management program to help reduce uh, mobile source emissions and improve air quality. Staff recommends approval. And the last item is item 31, is to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Thank you. Okay, so let's go through one more time, just to be sure. We've got uh, item nine. 14. Item 9, 14, 17, 21, 22, 23, 25, 26, 27, and 31. Okay. Commissioners? Just another question again. I, I had asked about maybe some visual aid on item 23. I don't know that I necessarily want to pull it from consent, but in order to have the opportunity to get that, do I need to pull it from consent? No, we, we can go ahead and, and show you that now if you'd like to see that. Um, do that we have that presentation ready? To, for the other commissioners, this deals with a uh, development that is um, on the North Gulch, uh, which is at the foot of the Capitol. And one of the regulations for, that we have for development in that area is a height limitation to make sure that the capital remains visible uh, from the outlying areas uh, between the capital and uh, the neighborhoods. And so we had uh, some of the technology that y'all saw during the retreat used uh, to create a 3D image so that you can see exactly what the viewscape is with that building in place. That was my question. And the, the okay. yellow building that's being shown is the proposed building. So, doesn't so the green and the red are two different viewpoints, and the green is where the view is not obstructed, red is where it is. So and that does not include the new building that's right across the street now, right? Right, we didn't have time to put in the brand new one, but that's in a different sub-district that is. It is. Has a little higher, it's just along Charlotte. Oh and then it steps down. Okay. So they haven't exceeded the number of stories, it's just that it's 10 more feet than the DTC maximum. Do you guys want to see it again? Okay. <laughs> There's the top edge, as you can see. Mm -hmm. oh, that's John. Can, I, can you ask uh, for an interpretation? So what, what is it we're seeing? Are we seeing just a little <laughs> bit of the well, and, a If I get it to stop spinning, that would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> it's very nice. Are I'm getting dizzy. Okay, all right. I don't know. <laughs> At the beginning, if there's any way to, to zoom in on the capital itself. Yeah. And so um, the viewscape. I don't know if you can. From Charlotte, looking back towards the capital. Uh, if you go to about, uh, go to about 15 seconds, can you go to that? Where's Micah when you need him? Right. As it starts to zoom in here, I think is where it gives you the best perspective. It freeze it right there just for a second. And you can see that at least from this perspective, how you, you still have the visibility of the Capitol, uh, but the obstruction of, and it's not obstruction of vision of the Capitol from this point of view uh, to the left, but that section where you have the red is where it, it rises 10 feet above what uh, the design guidelines say for this area in the DTC. Um, and at that 10 feet, we need to bring it to y'all to approve that the, that the building could protrude above the 560, I think is what the regulation is there. Okay. Thank you, that's, that's just helpful to visualize. I just had a hard time imagining what, if 10 feet made that much difference or not. I'm, I'm satisfied, thank you. Okay, so are we ready to 
Make a motion. You want to read them off once more? Okay. Not. Mister? Okay, last time. So we've got 9, 14, 17, 21, 22, 23, 25, 26, 27, and 31. Make a motion to accept those on consent or approve them on consent. Have a second. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. So we are now down to our list of what we're going to be hearing tonight. Um, and if, if I will go through the list that we're going to be hearing, and if your item is not on here, then you are free to go. <laughs> um, we're going to hear one items one, three, four, six, seven, eight. 12A, 12B, 12C, and 24. And I guess we're ready to start with item one. Wait one second. Okay. I'm gonna let the other commissioner come back. Oh, forgot. I think we are all accounted for now. Um, let's go ahead and get started. All right. The next item on this evening's agenda is item one. This is a request to amend a previously approved specific plan for properties located at 1209 and 1213 Tulip Grove Road and Valley Grove unnumbered to permit up to 340 residential units and the subject parcels are outlined in red. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The site is currently zoned <coughs> SPMR, Specific Plan Mixed Residential, which is a zoning district category that provides for additional flexibility of design to provide the ability to implement the specific goals of the general plan. The policy for the site is conservation and T3 suburban uh, neighborhood evolving. Conservation policy is intended to preserve and enhance environmentally sensitive land. The T3 suburban neighborhood evolving policy is intended to create suburban neighborhoods that provide more opportunity for housing choice and improved connectivity. The resulting development patterns will have higher densities than existing neighborhoods with a broader range of housing type. The site contains 72 acres and is proposed to contain 340 units. A total of three housing units are included in the SP, single family and two separate types of townhome. 27.37 acres will remain as open space. The majority of the streets will be public. The access to the multifamily will be through private streets. Sidewalks will be constructed along all streets within the SP. This SP achieves two critical planning goals. It creates walkable neighborhoods by providing an internal network of walking trails and sidewalks along all streets and provides a range of housing choice by providing three individual housing types. In conclusion, staff's recommendation is to approve the conditions and disapprove without all conditions as this request is consistent with policy and satisfies two critical planning goals. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Is the developer of the applicant here?
Uh, for those of you standing in the back, we have a lot of seats down front if y'all want to come and sit down. Are you? Yeah, I'm, 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 okay. Okay, <laughs> you're I'm welcome. The I'm the you're the applicant. Okay, thank you. Can you state your name and address? And you. Will My name is Alan Wise at 1312 Central Court, Hermitage. Okay. okay. So this is the chance to tell us about your project. Yes, um, actually, we're, we're just asking for a, a few changes um, for the better uh, the betterment of the development, and we've been working closely with staff um, at the planning department for approximately six months. Um, they've been uh, very good to work with, but they've also fine-tuned our development to be a very beautiful project. And we're just asking okay. for a few changes for the development that was approved in 2007. Okay. Well, thank you. You will have two minutes for rebuttal. So if you just want to stay up front. And okay. Okay. Um, so can we, anyone speaking in favor of this project? Anyone speaking in opposition? Come on up. If you can give us your name and address, you'll have two minutes. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm in 304 Dewey Court, Hermitage, uh, which is in North New Hope Estates, which is adjacent to the, the uh, construction. Um, I have more of a concern than an opposition. Um, Central Pike, uh, Lebanon Dirt Road, and uh, North New Hope, which has no issues. But when, you, when you're when you trying to exit from our area, um, it's all jammed up in the morning and the evenings. Uh, I-40 also is jammed up. So my, more, my big concern is about safety. Ambulances, fire trucks, you know, it's, it's you, you can't get through there in the mornings. So putting 340 new homes, which is an average of 340, at least 340 cars, probably around 400 and some. So it's not really a opposition, it's more of a concern. What are we gonna do to fix Central Pike, uh, Lebanon Dirt Road? I guess it's Andrew Jackson Parkway, that gets jammed up as well. So my question is, what, what are we gonna do to fix those with the traffic issues that we have right now? Okay, okay, so, okay. thank you. Yep. Anyone else here speaking in opposition? Would the applicant like to come back up? You'll have two minutes if you'd like to address any. Okay. Okay, then we'll declare the public hearing closed. Um, and Commissioner Tibbs, would you like to start us off? Um, probably just with what we always wanted, you know, about the traffic study, you know, which we were all, the traffic impact, I guess, if public works or someone could speak on that. I just got to go first, but normally that's what we want. It is a lot of a lot of homes, but otherwise, I don't have a concern. That was the only thing I was since the person brought it up. Who's our guy? So we we, we know you're behind that pillar. I know. <laughs> <laughs> He's He's ready ready for Rick. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, um, as far as a traffic study, a traffic study would have been conducted originally back in 2007, is that? And, and with a revision update. Uh, as far as the re uh, traffic study itself, I have not reviewed the traffic study. It would have been done by our traffic engineer office, so I cannot speak to the specifics. Um, the applicant did submit a new traffic impact study for the amendment to the SP. This number, the unit count has stayed the same as the original SP. Um, the traffic impact study also includes a number of conditions for approval, um, such as turn lanes being constructed, um, road improvements along Meyer Drive, which you can see to the north uh, eastern portion of the site plan. Um, other things such as site distance um, conditions uh, that should be submitted with the final um, a left uh, a southbound left turn lane um, on Tulip Grove Road, um, a northbound right turn lane on Tulip Grove Road at Myra Drive. Um, also, uh, investigation of constructability of the southbound turn lane um, for Tulip Grove Road at Myra Drive. So we have several conditions for the uh, newly submitted traffic impact study, which should alleviate some of the 
problems that we may see potentially from this development. Great, thank you. Commissioner Hagen dear. Okay. No. no. Uh, in fact, the study is okay. I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay. Uh, Council lady. I have a couple of questions. This one was deferred from earlier and, and before when we got the recommendation, the answer to is it consistent with policy was no. Um, and I think one of the biggest issue was about um, why were we changing from the original SP that uh, had rear entrance to all the garages and now they're all front loading. Um, and I don't see that that has changed from the deferral. Um, and then there was some, some question about whether the, the open space was integrated. So I just would like to hear what, you know, number one, why we're changing from the original SP, which seemed to have gotten everyone's blessing to something that was deferred later and had some concerns. And I don't, I don't, I can't tell what's changed other than there were some units deleted on the north part, which does open up some open space, but it doesn't seem to be integrated, which was one of the concerns. So if you could address that, that would be helpful. One of the original comments um, from the previous, previous recommendation of disapproval was that when we have a front-loaded product, we were introducing conflict between pedestrians and um, you might say cars, uh, people accessing those lots. Um, so the plan does include an internal network of walking trails, which should help alleviate any sort of those conflicts okay. by providing people an alternate route to navigate through, whether it be for recreation or actively seeking out uh, to travel by foot um, to another location. Um, additionally, um, the integrated open space, as we worked with the applicant to adjust the drive aisles, mainly the private drives for the, the multifamily products, we had them switch from having front-loaded parking and having the rears of the multifamily um, not, act, not provide a better um, way to address the open space. We've now had those um, alternated where we have the units fronting the open space. That is okay. now the focal point for the majority of the multifamily product that we have in this development. Um, also, much of the um, floodplain that you see in the Northwest where we previously had units, that was part of the recommendation of disapproval. Those units have now been taken away to protect the integrity of the uh, buffers along the uh, floodplain to the Northwest, or excuse me, Northeast of the site. Um, as well as, which you can't see here, is um, steep and um, steep slopes. Uh, from 20 to 25 percent um, will now remain undisturbed. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. So, just I guess for the benefit of the um, person raising some questions, when when we talk about road improvements that were made part of the conditions of this approval by staff, that are those are road road condition changes, road improvements that, that the, um, the developer is responsible for, as opposed to a hope that the city will get around to it. Is that correct? These must be done by this developer or someone acting on his behalf before final approvals. That's correct. Okay. Any other comments? Anyone? Make a motion uh, to hold approve. On. I'm sorry. No. Okay. No, hold on. Okay, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're, you're good. <laughs> I see that there is a question, but no, you're, you're good. Please make a motion. Now? Yes. Okay. I'd make a motion we approve with staff recommendations. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. 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 We're on to item number three. This item on the agenda is item three. This is a request for a zone change from office residential intensive to specific plan commercial for property located at 50 Music Square West. The property is outlined in red and it is the site of an existing nine story office building at Music Square West and Chet Atkins Place. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. 
The current zoning on the property is office residential intensive, which is designed to provide adequate and suitable spaces in appropriate locations for high intensity office uses compatible with high density residential. The land use policy on the site is district office concentration, which is intended to preserve, enhance, and create districts where office use is predominant and where opportunities for addition of complementary uses are present. Additionally, this site is located in a special policy area established by the Music Road Detailed Design Plan, which was approved by the Planning Commission in December. Um, the property is outlined in red um, on this slide, and the special policy area that applies to that property is um, highlighted in yellow. Um, the policy provides guidance on height, frontage, parking and access, lighting, and landscaping. And specifically, um, it provides guidance that height in this special policy area should be eight stories. Um, this policy serves as a transition between um, some areas of the Music Road Detailed Design Plan with um, taller buildings um, at the north end by the roundabout, um, and then also between a special policy in the Midtown Study Area to the west and the Edge, Edge Hill neighborhood, which is in um, neighborhood maintenance policy to the east, and both of those um, have smaller residential lot pattern. Um, so this is, the eight stories is kind of in between those things. Um, the existing structure, as it stands today, is already nine stories. Um, the proposal before us today would expand that um, to 11 stories. However, the building in question is the United Artists Tower. Um, it was built between 1973 and 1975, um, and it's iconic for its, its height in the neighborhood and also its connection to the music industry. Um, the overall height of the structure following the expansion would actually be consistent with the height of a new eight-story office building if built today um, because floor-to-ceiling heights have increased over time. Um, and so staff is, finds that the proposal to increase the height is consistent with the special policy because of the iconic nature of the building um, and because the height um, would not exceed something if a new structure were to be built on this site. The proposed site plan um, is on the screen. The building footprint is outlined in red. This um, building sits on top of a raised platform, um, so the, the whole site is elevated. Um, the proposal is for a hotel and restaurant. Um, it is an expansion of the existing octagonal structure. Um, it would be 180 rooms of hotel and 6,270 square feet of restaurant in 11 stories. There are 137 parking spaces in the below grade parking garage. Um, it is our understanding, although it's not part of the SP, that the applicant um, and the neighborhood have worked together um, and come to agreement on some um, standards that would help to minimize impacts of parking associated with these uses. Um, and so they've all collectively um, agreed to work with that, but that's beyond the scope of the SP. This plan does support two um, critical planning goals. It supports redevelopment of a site with existing infrastructure. Um, and it also preserves historic resources. Although previous renovations to the building have impacted its historic integrity and its National Register eligibility, um, it remains iconic for its height and its connection to the music industry. And this SP would present an opportunity um, to incorporate that building into a new development um, while preserving the height and reactivating the space. So staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Applicant wants to come up. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Gore. I'm with Varge Coffin and Associates, and we are the applicant for this request. Uh, as staff mentioned, this is a request for a zone 0.5 acres uh, from ORI to SP. Uh, the proposal is to allow for the renovations and additions to the existing building uh, to be converted into a uh, hotel and a restaurant. We have uh, deferred this uh, request uh, multiple times so there could be some additional meetings with the different neighborhood groups and the developers uh, which have occurred. Uh, and the staff um, alluded to there's some additional, um, some additional requirements and some additional um, understandings from parking and valet drop-off and things like that that are referenced in the staff report that uh, we're in agreement between the uh, developer and the neighbors and Councilman O'Connell. Uh, we have uh, performed a traffic impact study the Metro Public Works has uh, reviewed and approved, and we have also um, 
received approval from the other <coughs> metro departments that reviewed. So uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions you have, but we would uh, request approval and we appreciate your time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody here speaking in support of the project? Anyone here speaking in opposition? You can state your name and address, you'll have two minutes. Okay. My name is Ronald Miller, 905 Villa Place. We had worked with uh, Mr. Zeitlin and his group, and we came up with four items that is listed in the staff report. But I thought I heard that it's not a part of the SP. And the part that we're concerned about is the parking. The four items on your page um, states about the garage parking being 7, 24, 365 days a week. Is that going to be a part of the SP? Is what I'd like to know. Uh, event parking and these are things that we agreed upon, which is listed in your package. And we're making sure that, for clarification, that we are protected. With over 400 units going in in that one block, approximately less than a football field away from my house, we're concerned about what can happen with the parking in that area with so many units being developed. So we would like some clarification. Thank you. Anybody else here to speak in opposition to this project? Uh, would the applicant like to come back and... Have, have two minutes for your rebuttal? Uh, sure, I just want to address the, uh, the four conditions that were agreed on uh, between the neighbors, the councilmen, and the uh, owners. I believe the staff didn't want to put them as conditions of approval because they weren't sure exactly how they would be administered from a zoning perspective. They have to do with uh, requiring valet drop off and things like that. But I believe that the council person uh, has, Councilman O'Connell has the ability to put those in the bill, uh, the council bill as conditions if the neighborhood would like. So I think that's why they didn't uh, end up as specific conditions on the, um, on the rezoning request. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll declare the public hearing closed, and um, maybe can we just have staff address the comment? Certainly. So the, the conditions that were put forth, um, I guess I should start by saying clearly that the, the parking that was proposed um, was reviewed as part of the traffic and parking study, um, which was approved by Public Works. So as far as the requirements for parking established by the code, um, this has been um, found in conformance with that. The conditions that were um, submitted by the applicant would go above and beyond that. Um, you know, in terms of how they would manage the operation of the parking on site um, and how they would have their employees park, how they would handle um, if they have a need for additional parking off site in the future. Um, but they were, as the applicant stated, items that, that might be difficult to enforce from a, from a zoning perspective, um, and including a condition such as facilitating a conversation, which is a little outside the scope of the code. So that's why they're reflected there to acknowledge that, that everyone has come to agreement on them, um, but they're not incorporated as conditions of the SP. Can you also clarify if that is something that as a council bill could be incorporated? <laughs> well, it's how you administer it. I mean, they can be yeah. put into the council bill, but then how, how they enforce is really the issue. Um, so if they amended that to, to add that there would be valet parking, you know, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, they can put that into the bill. And certainly if they're failing to do that, then I guess the codes could send a, you know, someone out to see whether or not they're doing the valet as, as the code requires. And they could cite them and take them into environmental court. I and mean, I assume that that would be the, the mechanism. but. To put it into the zoning bill, I don't think right. would be appropriate. No, I just was trying to make sure that we confirmed for the person who commented how it could be handled. Okay. Um, 
Well, we'll start with the commissioners. Council lady, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I will just say I, I have a bill that was on that was on deferral that had to do with parking in my neighborhood, and I know that's often a big issue, um, the Martin Center field. Um, that's often a big issue for neighbors, um, and it's certainly important to to make sure that that is that is addressed. I mean, I'm I'm certainly willing to, from the council perspective, uh, encourage the council member to make sure that that is addressed officially as as a, a part of the document. Um, you know, again, we we can't speak to how codes enforces, but we're certainly trying to help them get more tools to be able to do that effectively. Great. Any other? Comments or questions? Um, I'll just say, um, I mean, in, in, in looking at the comments about um, unique, quote, preservation of, a, of an iconic historic building, will the octagonal shape be visible from any direction at all? Is that like an outside wall that you see from the inside now? or? I might defer to the applicant on exactly what the interior will look like, but we will lose the octagonal shape from the, from the outside of the building, yes. Could we get the the engineer to answer that? John, you want to come back up? Making you do laps. Uh, yes, there's additions on all sides, so the octagonal shape uh, will not remain. I believe there's um, parts of the design, some public art on the north side that are proposed that kind of reference, um, reference the original architecture to kind of um, uh, preserve it in that way, but that the actual shape itself, the footprint is expanding, so it's not an, um, the same shape anymore. And so, even from inside the building, you won't you won't recognize that necessarily. I don't. I can't speak from inside the building. I don't believe. I don't okay. believe there's a. You're um, from maybe on the ground floor, but on the floors above that, you wouldn't be able to tell. Okay. Right. Thank you. So it's really the height that makes it iconic that's being preserved, not the. Yes, ma'am. The cool shape. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. I've known uh, neighbors in this area, and I've known Mr. Miller a long time, and I can understand why the kinds of changes that we are seeing have been uh, truly, um, you know, overwhelming. Um, I gather from what we've been hearing that, of course, there is no, there's nothing in the um, Music Row plan as it was finally determined that preserves buildings at all as I recall, and this is, in fact, being preserved. I'm, I, I'm a little worried about um, this. It is true that this commission, it, it's really not our purview to put a lot of operational issues into what we approve, but on the other hand, I can see why people would like some guarantees. Um, as far as the, uh, the octagonal, you know, I, I don't know if we came to Nashville about the same time maybe we did, but I came in 1969 and lived about four blocks from this, and I always thought, gee, th this doesn't look like anything else in the whole area, and uh, maybe someday we can make it look better. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I just lost all my credibility as a historic preservationist, but but uh, that's, that's not bothering me much, but but I really, I know the council member for this area too pretty well, and I have a feeling he's going to put every possible um, constraint and um, approval. Um, I know this neighborhood and this neighborhood association have worked very hard and are generally supportive of this. So I, I, I think I think we should approve it, but with the understanding that um, there's a lot of credibility on the line with this for the folks involved. Can I add to the? We we actually spent quite a bit of time with the applicant and with the council member over this pr this project. And um, when you go into the building today, uh, there's little more than the columns, uh, the, the structure, the, I guess the uh, superstructure inside it is it. Everything else has been stripped away actually a number of times uh, and rebuilt. Uh, one of the things that we'd hope to do, if they were going to really change the form of the building itself, was to change the way that it addressed the pedestrian environment. That, that we felt like that if there's anything that we could achieve uh, with this redevelopment is to make the building interact with the public space better. And I think that the, they've, they've worked hard to do that. There are some challenges because of the way that the garage uh, elevates out of the ground right at the edge of the, of the sidewalk. Uh, but they've even softened that and um, 
made it so that it opens up to the corner much better, some topography issues as well. Uh, but that was, as we worked through the design, was one of the major focuses was to move away from the design that really moved this building away from the pedestrian environment and isolated it, and it was built that way intentionally and, and make it so that it actually, the open space at the ground level opens up to the sidewalks. And so I think that this design's done about as good a job as they can for that. Clarification, um, Chairman? Mr. Um, Haynes? It's not our purview to try to legislate parking. Um, it will be Councilman O'Connell's responsibility. This is going to be a challenge. When you take a 6,000 square foot restaurant, all the employees for the hotel and the restaurant, 180 room hotel and only 138 parking spaces in a neighborhood that if you try to go to Edge Hill today and have dinner in any of those places, there is no parking. So it will be important for Councilman O'Connell and staff to work through the, the bill that goes through council. Thank you. Commissioner Hagenier. I have no comments. Okay. Commissioner Tibbs. Um, of course, from a historical standpoint, it would have been cool to have been able to keep the octagon. The, um, um, the fact that it is so unique makes it unique um, in that something different for the area. But I, I do understand that um, there's been a lot of other, you know, efforts to try to do something and it's like Doug said now a lot of the interior is already stripped out of it from a planning standpoint I'm glad we were able to try to address the pedestrian part of it but um, like I said it, from a historical standpoint it's, it's, it, it was iconic you know it, there was nothing like it except maybe um, in California where was the other one so um, but anyway that, that's my only comment um, it looks like that based on what they could do, they've, they've addressed it as well as possible, but that's it. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Anybody ready to make a motion? I move we approve staff recommendation. Thank you. Second. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm gonna oppose just to Wish the octagon was still okay. around. Thank you. Okay, we are on to item number four. <laughs> okay, I, I will be presenting items 4A and 4B together as they are associated cases. Item 4A is a request to rezone from MUN and OL to SP commercial for property located south of Old Hickory Boulevard and east of Cloverland Drive. Staff recommendation is to disapprove the request. The current zoning on the property is part MUN, part OL, and within a planned unit development overlay. The current planned unit development is approved for 16 residential units and approximately 13,000 square feet of office uses. The proposed site plan, uh, the proposed SP is for a 116,304 square foot self-service storage facility. The height of the proposed building would be four stories and 48 feet. Uh, the building outline, the building layout is outlined for you in red. Uh, there are two entrances proposed off of Old Hickory Boulevard. A B level landscape buffer is provided along the western property line adjacent to existing residential. Self-service storage is uh, allowed as by right in the zoning code in both CS and in industrial districts. Uh, were this to be in CS, it would require a C buffer and industrial districts would require a D buffer between this and the residential uses. Uh, the applicant has provided building elevations. The top elevation is the uh, building along Old Hickory Boulevard facade. The bottom elevation is the west facade adjacent to the existing residential. Uh, the, these are showing the south facade and the east facade of the building. Uh, this is a model showing the um, bulk of the building in relation to the existing residential uses. 
The land use policy for the area is T3 Suburban Residential Corridor and Conservation. The conservation on the property recognizes a stream and the associated buffers that transects the property. Um, the T3 Residential Corridor policy is a policy that's intended to preserve, enhance, and create suburban residential corridors with a mixture of residential housing types. Um, these corridors are, this policy is generally located along prominent arterials and collectors. The proposal is inconsistent with the policy. The policy is a residential only policy and it does not support commercial uses. Now, while the currently approved PUD, which is for office, may not be supported, rezoning to allow a more intense commercial use um, is moving further from the goals of the policy. The, um, the red arrow here is pointing you to the location of the property and where it's uh, integrated in with other land use policies. So it is in a larger area of residential corridor policy and the policy immediately to the south is suburban neighborhood maintenance. Uh, this map will show you some surrounding land uses for the area. Um, so to the south is primarily single family, uh, and two family. There is some multifamily also along the corridor there. Um, closer to the interstate, there are some commercial uses. However, the land use generally decreases in intensity as you move east from the interstate interchange, which is located uh, to the left hand side of the screen there. Um, so the, the area of red that you see, that is some commercial uses. As you move further away from the interstate, you're moving into more uh, residential and with some office uses. Staff recommends disapproval for several reasons. First, the residential corridor policy is a residential only policy. It supports and, in, and encourages a mixture of housing types along prominent corridors. Um, this is adjacent immediately to neighborhood maintenance policy and the proposed height and intensity are inconsistent with the surrounding uses as well as the existing land, u land use pattern where as you move from the interchange, you're moving, the uses are decreasing in intensity. So again, staff recommends disapproval. Uh, this is the PUD cancellation, which is the, sec which is the associated case. And this would be a request to cancel the PUD for the entire property. Staff is again recommending disapproval of this. Uh, the existing zoning is MUNOL with a PUD overlay. Uh, the PUD is approved for 16 residential units, 12,960 square feet of office and medical, um, office, medical office, and outpatient clinic. Um, at the time of the rezoning, at the time of the original PUD, all of the base zone was MUN. In 2012, the PUD was amended to change some of the layout and also partly zoned to OL, Office Limited. Uh, that was due to the fact that MUN limited individual offices to 2,500 square feet and so rezoning to OL allowed for um, a, one larger office. The, this was the most currently approved amended plan for the PUD in 2012. Uh, the area hatched in red is the proposed footprint of the office building at that time. Um, as approved, it was two stories with a maximum of 30 uh, feet in height. Um, again, the policy is conservation residential corridor. We talked about what those met, uh, meant earlier. Um, so it is a residential only policy. Now, while the, while the existing PUD is inconsistent with the policy, it's closer to the policy than the requested zoning uh, to allow for self-service storage. Um, if the property is not redeveloping in a manner that's consistent with the policy, then the PUD should be maintained as the PUD uses are more compatible with the existing residential than the proposal. So therefore, staff recommends disapproval. Thank you. So we're hearing 4A and 4B. We're going to hear everything together, but vote separately. Is that correct? <coughs> okay. Uh, is the applicant here? You'll have 10 minutes if you can state your name and address. Oh, all right. Thank you. I'm Travis Todd with Little John Engineering Associates. I'm at 5904 Cross Point Lane in Brentwood, just right, or, right around the corner from the project. And I'm uh, speaking on behalf of my client, Skip Elefante of Platinum Storage. And I'll um, just give a, a, a bit of a history on, on 
why uh, Skip is looking at this site for this particular use. We know it it is owned a, a residential policy. Um, again, the PUD was approved in 2008 with a mix of the uses that you just heard. So some some um, some commercial, some office on there. Uh, the study that was done by Public Works um, showed about 500 trips per day coming in and out of the site. And we know that traffic and stormwater are typically some of the biggest issues when you're looking at redevelopment. So 500 trips per day on you know, a six lane Old Hickory Boulevard right here is, is significant. Um, so um, Platinum Storage landed on the site believing that you know, a high end climate controlled self storage facility would be the highest and best use uh, for the site. Um, it has no impact on the schools in the area. It cleans up a site that's really been blighted for a decade now. Some, some infrastructure was um, installed at the site for the proposed development, uh, but it's been sitting vacant for 10 years. Um, and there has been some, a lot of complaints about the site since then, so it's cleaning that up. And it dramatically reduces the traffic that would be generated even over the PUD that's approved today. Um, Public Works did a, uh, a quick tri tri trip generation study and a calculation showed that the proposed use, the storage use, would decrease the traffic by 58% over the uh, approved PUD today. Um, actual counts from similar projects that my client has, has developed show that it would actually be about an 80% reduction in traffic over what's approved in the PUD today. Um, so we've, we've kind of looked at the traffic issue. Only, it's only about 30 trips per day on, on a weekday, about 60 trips per day on a weekend. Um, we've also looked at, uh, as you see, it's a little bit tough to, tough to see on this, on this slide, but there is a stream that runs diagonal through the site. It, it bisects the site, and we're fully respecting that. It's got 30-foot buffers on either side that, that we're leaving in place. Um, what you actually don't see on this, and can you, Lisa, would you be able to go back to the plan that shows the block uh, model that you guys put together with the blue building on it? We had a rendered landscape plan, but it doesn't look like it got included in, in, the, in the slides here. Um, you, you see the building that's proposed in the foreground. Uh, you, can, you can see a stream bisects the site. There were two buildings proposed on the site. There was a 48,000 square foot three-story building proposed in the back corner. Um, so we, we had that there. We've had four community meetings, including one uh, this afternoon with the presidents of the HOAs that immediately surround uh, the site. Um, and at their request, we've rem completely removed one of the buildings that was in the back. Uh, so that's completely gone, um, which was the, the major concern. Um, my client has offered to, to leave that back triangle as a pocket park and actually dedicate that to those neighborhoods to use as a pocket park uh, that they could use. It would be walkable from Fredericksburg Townhomes, Britton Park, and President's Reserve. Um, and so we've offered that. Uh, there's really no dedicated open space to them in that vicinity that they can walk to, uh, Old Hickory Boulevard being what it is. So we've, so we've offered that. Um, so we've also looked at what else could this develop into? If, it doesn't, if this use isn't approved, what else could this be? And I believe that a residential use is, as its policy today, you could go a lot more dense than the currently approved PUD, which I think would only increase the traffic problems. Um, so we've really tried to work with the neighbors, and I don't know, the, the people we met with this afternoon uh, were going to come. I don't know if they're here anymore uh, to, to speak against it. I think we address most of their concerns and want to work with those HOAs going forward. Um, so I'd like to introduce my client, Skip Elefante, to speak for a moment. I don't know if it makes a difference, but when I first bought this property, I knew it wasn't zoned, but I knew after being in the storage business, well, I'm Skip Elefante with Platinum Storage Group, and when I first saw this project, even though it wasn't zoned, I knew after being in this business for over 30 plus years that it was the highest best use from a traffic impact perspective, um, even though I saw the, the traffic count that was generated by, the, by planning. I know for a fact that I operate, I own and operate other facilities that are as large as, as this project and larger. And I know that we have the lowest uh, traffic impact of any, almost any product type, commercial product type. And so I feel that, and I know it's not zoned again, but I feel that it is the highest and best use for this property. And we, I have, I have uh, met multiple times with the surrounding associations and and are willing to dedicate that back almost acre and a third to, the, to, to make it a, a park for them, for their enjoyment. And I think that's a pretty good compromise moving forward. Thank you. 
go ahead and you can hold two minutes back for rebuttal. Councilman, would you like to speak now? If there's nobody else, yes. Uh, is there anybody here speaking in support of this project? Anybody speaking in opposition? Okay, well then, Councilman, you're it. Hi. How are you all sitting in? We're good. How are you? Good. Trying to get out of here. And <laughs> obviously, one got pulled off a consent, so I'm going to be here with you for a while. Uh, Robert Swope, Council District 4. Um, I know this is a mess of a piece of property. Um, this was one that when I first took over this council district, I looked at it and cried because I knew this was going to happen. Um, the current zoning on this, if you were to build 16 residential units and 14,000 square feet of office building, uh, you've got about 2,200 day trips or trips a day in traffic. At that intersection, which isn't even on a corner, uh, Old Hickory Boulevard would be an absolute disaster area, uh, which it already kind of is, but that would make it a whole lot worse. Um, I've probably said no to upwards of 40 different ideas for this piece of property, including some idiot that wanted to build 300 condos on it, and I went, really? Where are you going to put them? Uh, and where's traffic going to go? Um, when Skip called me and said, can he put a storage building on it? My first response was, is absolutely not. Because I think of public storage as having orange doors and drive in and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I said, no, ain't gonna happen. Um, but he was persistent. Uh, this is, I'm gonna call it personal storage because there's no drive up doors, there's no nothing. It is literally designed to look exactly like Seven Springs, which is directly across the street. Um, so when you say there's no commercial in the area, well, Seven Springs is pretty commercial. Um, I don't know that I would have ever supported that development, but since it's there, and since we have this particular piece of property, which is a nightmare in current zoning, I opted to support this because the only thing less in traffic is the cemetery. Um, he's, the, client, the applicant has shown me multiple uh, studies they've done on other facilities around the country, basically the same size. They're averaging 30 trips a day. Now, that's a whole big reduction from over 2,000 a day. Um, I know this violates the policy. Um, I very much appreciate the planning staff. God bless you all. I love you. I'm sorry to disagree with you on this, but uh, this one particular instance I don't think the policy is best for the community. Um, and to that end, as the applicant has already said, we've had four community meetings, including a fifth one today with the uh, directors of the HOAs in Brenton Park, Fredericksburg, and President's Reserve, which are the three on either side of this. They opted not to come today because they're all pretty much for this, which was quite surprising to me. I figured somebody would show up against this. Um, we are going to do in council a permanent grant of an easement to the three HOAs for the use of, well, half of this land for a pocket park. Um, the applicant has agreed to build the park and the HOAs are agreeing to maintain it. So the neighbors are all fine with this. And in my mind, much more so than policy, it's how the community feels about it. And the community realizes that we can have this with a good neighbor and a pocket park, or we can have more residential and retail going in right in their backyards that would eat up every single square inch of this 2.8 acres. Um, I ask for your approval of this, and in, and in, in turn the approval of the PUD cancellation. Um, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll declare the public hearing closed. Um, and Commissioner Clifton, would you like to start us off? Not particularly. You like to talk about policy. <laughs> That's why I picked you. <laughs> I'd like um, I'd like a little more help from the staff about this. I know that we're under no, um, that our staff really has no choice but to look at this in terms of what we now have, but we have occasionally looked at things and said we would be happy to support this if the commission w wants to change the, the policy. Uh, is this something that 
Can you address that? Did you know what I'm asking here? You're, you're not saying we can only do this, we can only uh, approve this if we uh, approve policy and that that's okay with us. You're saying really neither one of those should happen. The residential corridor policy that is on this property and that is along this south of um, Old Hickory Boulevard and for the most part north of Old Hickory Boulevard um, was put into place with Nashville Next, what so was adopted a yeah. little more than a year ago. And so it was determined at that time that that was the correct policy for the property given the existing land uses in the area and the development pattern. So. Um, I don't know that that necessarily answers the question. I don't think that we evaluated that. We just, the policy was recently deemed adopted. to be, right, was recently adopted. Right. I suppose, I mean, we've, we've actually seen a lot of activity over the last few years about this, this kind of product of storage. And I guess it's because of the low, low use. Um, uh, and also it's fairly inexpensive usually to to build, I, this seems like a different thing than what I'm used to. Though I'm used to, to um, what he described, uh, where you drive your car right up. Uh, I'm, I think it's an intriguing idea, and and knowing that area, it's it's amazing to have uh, something like this without opposition. <laughs> uh, that, however, is more a political issue than a planning issue, so I'm, I'm, I'll be very intrigued by how our discussion goes. How about that? Thank you very much. Oh, Commissioner Diaz, yes. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Um, I think overall, obviously, I think the, the um, policy is there for a reason, and I think that the policy being there was considered because of the corridor and its proximity to um, commercial and the interstate. And since this doesn't, you know, follow the policy and doesn't meet the policy, then we can't really approve it. But I do want to touch on, you know, the traffic issue. I understand the traffic concerns here and I've driven on it. I know what it's like and it's, it's, you know, it's not great, it's horrible. But I feel like over time with our Nashville Next um, plan and, tr you know, we just had a transit um, overview this evening and the goals that we have for transit and improving that, I think if we approve this, we will regret it if we have transit that can sustain that and reduce traffic or vehicular traffic. Um, I think we're acting on something that, yes, it could be the best in, you know, use now, but what about in the future? And I think that's, you know, our goal here as planning is approving things that we can be proud of for the future. And so that's why I support planning's recommendation. Thank you. Council Lady? Thank you. Um, can you help me understand how we define, in, I think intensity was the, was the word that you used, that, that a, a self-storage place is seen as a more intense use than office um, or, the, or the residential office mix. And yet, from a traffic standpoint, it seems that it's not intense. So, what what determines well, intensity? Okay, first, I wanted I did want to point out too, and I, I meant to mention this earlier, but I did provide you with an updated memo today with an updated traffic study, um, the um, a traffic table that was updated based on the actual permitted uses of the PUD versus what was proposed, um, and so I think that was um, about a 200 trip difference between the 16 residential units and the 13,000 square feet of office versus the 116,000 square feet of, of uh, mini storage. Um, so when we were talking about intensity of uses, um, what we're really talking about, and, and the, the traffic um, the traffic table was um, not a factor in our consideration of disapproval. Um, it's the policy is not supportive of this use and that the, the existing PUD is closer to the um, goals of the policy. So when we're talking about intensity, we're looking at it from uh, several different aspects. Um, the, the massing is one. Um, the existing pod uh, permitted the 
the as as approved, the existing PUD with the 13,000 square feet would be a two-story office building um, in a maximum height of around 30 feet. And so this is a four-story building and a maximum height of about 48 feet. Um, it, we also look at the um, where the uses are allowed in base zoning districts. And so when we're looking at a self-service storage facility, it's generally permitted in more intense commercial zoning districts such as CS. It's also permitted in industrial zoning districts. And so um, it's placed into those zoning categories because it is more intense user um, than an office or a residential use. Okay, um, and then uh, another question was if, if some other use were built here, how would they deal with this stream? Are they obligated to leave it in place or can they just blaze right over it? Storm well, that's, do we have storm water here? Yes. Hi there. I'm Roy Nestor with uh, Metro Water. Um, on the stream, yes, uh, by rule it has to stay. Um, to remove it, they have to go before the Stormwater Management Committee um, to remove the stream. So they can, but that's another process. So. And how is that usually handled at the stormwater? Do they usually say, no big deal, just stick a rain garden over no. there, or is it a hard process no, to go it, through? it's a harder process when it's a stream. Gotcha. So. Okay. All right. So that's important to you. Okay, I'm going to listen to my fellow commissioners. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. I know this is not the policy for that side, um, but when you look at it, it does have a residential look. It's going to be very hard on that policy with the uh, stream going through it to really build any residential unless you go much higher. Um, listen to other commissioners, but I, I, other than the difference in the policy, I think it's a great use, and the um, it, it's not obtrusive. Um, it, it's an SP, so we're going to be able to control the materials and the colors and stuff like that. It's not going to have the garage, the orange doors that uh, the councilman was alluding to a while ago that he was glad they weren't. Um, I'll listen to other commissioners, but I think it's other than the policy, and I'm not sure how we we'll get around that, but it, I think it's a good design. Commissioner Haynes. Um, I very rarely disagree with you, Chairman. Um, well, don't this time, then. <laughs> I'm going to support staff's recommendation. I think this is the, the wrong use in the wrong area, and I think the policy needs to stay put. Thank you. Commissioner hagen -Deer. I'm going to agree with my neighbor, which is also not all of the time. <laughs> um, I support the staff's recommendation. I mean, we've got to be consistent with the policy at this point. Commissioner Tips. Also um, support staff, um, but I think um, Commissioner Diaz actually spoke it better. It's like you're looking right today. I can understand. I travel this regularly as well, and the traffic is. But it's like we're making. I think we're making a decision based on what's happening right today with the traffic, as opposed to that residential quarter. And it would seem. It almost would seem odd to have this. I agree with. Uh, it was more of an industrial, uh, I guess what staff would talked about, that's kind of, you know, in a different area. I love the pocket park. They they almost got me with the pocket park. But um, I, I, I just feel like, though, with the residential area there, that this would not be consistent as well as not be consistent with policy. Can I ask staff one question? Um, so if they came in today and wanted to build to the current SP, they, they could go in and just put an office building in there, right? The, this is the currently approved plan, which includes the office building shown in this location. I mean, if they wanted to do something different than what's shown on this plan, then they would have to come in for a PUD revision. If they wanted to do a different use, it'd have to be an amendment. Right, but so it's not gonna, but as you say in the memo, we're not sticking really to the residential policy we're, we're inconsistent with residential policy as it is right now. It is inconsistent, but changing it to this use would be moving Even further more away from the goals. Yes. Okay. Um, can I ask the applicant what I would? Yeah, if we could just respond to a couple things that have, that have been 
Sure. I don't think they had a chance for rebuttal. Ar architecturally, this building could be whatever it needs to be. We've offered that to the to the neighbors as well. If we need to put something on the back to, to break up the massing, if it needs to be brick to match the townhomes next door, that's th those are all things that, that we can work on together. Um, we've we're talking about it being in a residential corridor across the street. Our office buildings, uh, that whole north side, are office buildings. If you pan just a little bit to the right on the screen. The policy, it's, you're, you're in Nippers Corner, you're back in commercial, heavy commercial. And so it's really a pocket of residential between the two that we're talking about. And this is right on that edge. Um, we've also, with the, with the pocket park idea, um, we almost got you with that one you said. Uh, we, we told the neighbors, this is really a chance to get that and preserve that in your backyards forever. Because if we don't develop it, someone will. They'll have to develop on that back corner to make sense of it. Um, and, and you'll have that two or three story residential right in your backyard. And I don't think redevelopment of the site will wait on the transit improvements. Um, so it's, if a more intense residential use comes in, and I think you could easily fit, you know, 75 units on a, a site this size with the traffic mitigation. I talked to Public Works about that today, a single entry, uh, they would support that. I think it's gonna be a significant burden on Old Hickory. There's already transit there today. Um, that's not that's not used by the residents on that corridor until you get to the either end of the corridor. There's there's I think there's one stop in between. So redevelopment, the additional traffic is going to happen way ahead of the transit improvement. So those are just a few things we wanted to to clarify. Okay, thank you, thank you. commissioners. Any other discussion? Anyone, Commissioner Clifton? Yeah, I. It's I think it's been an interesting discussion. We all know and have on many occasions in the same meeting approved a policy change to do something like this. So I was waiting to see you know, how we thought about that as commissioners and as the staff. And it seems like this, everyone is fairly convinced that for various reasons this isn't. It's not just that we can't do this because the current policy isn't that. We often change policy. We haven't studied this change and it, it seems that it doesn't recommend itself to, to most folks. but. I, um, so I'm in, I think I've been persuaded by the rest of my commissioners here, but uh, it, I do understand how absolutely <laughs> frustrating it is as, as an elected official to, to, to be trying to find out what's best for an area that has no good solutions and just incredible popular area that, that people want to want to build in. I, I just think probably the, um, it, the 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 newness of our policy on this, the fact that there's been nothing to change uh, that we can hang a change on, um, I think that from a planning perspective, and you know, there's a reason why the council has the final say by our metro charter. It's certainly not unheard of for, for us to be overruled, but from, as, from we're only supposed to be dealing with a planning issue and not a political issue. So, so I'll be joining joining those who who cannot support this. Does anybody want to make the motion? Oh, Council Lady, I'm oh, sorry. I just want to make some statements because I'm, as like Commissioner Clifton, I'm, I'm kind of torn between hearing what my, my fellow council member is saying and, uh, you know, that the neighborhood has been supportive and the, the, pocket, the pocket park, you know, is, that's hard to resist. Um, however, I don't, I don't see those things written into this SP yet. Um, and that makes me nervous just from, I mean, it, it's good to say we're going to dedicate the pocket park. Um, and then also architecturally we can make this better, but that's, you know, the, it's not included in the elevations that we see here. I don't know if that necessarily means that I would ask for a deferral, but it makes me slightly more comfortable saying I'm, I'm not comfortable supporting this. Perhaps when it comes before the council, I'm looking at it from a different viewpoint, I will have a different conclusion. So with that statement made, I'm, I'm, I'm going with Commissioner Clifton here. Okay. So who's making the motion one way or the other? I can make a motion. I'll um, move to support staff's recommendation to disapprove uh, submitted. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Wait, so that was 4A. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the first item on the yeah, sorry. agenda. 4A. And so, again, I'm sorry that I interrupt you while you're getting the count. So, can we get a, another all in favor for 4A? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. 
Uh, now we're on item 4B. Uh, and if I could encourage the, the commission, since you didn't approve 4A, I don't think you should cancel <coughs> the PUD at this time. But we still have to vote on it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> just make sure to be consistent here. Yes. Uh, a motion to approve to Should approve staff that? recommendation. Okay. Um, move to support staff's recommendation on 4B to disapprove the PUD cancellation. <coughs> and uh, second. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Um, we are on item six. The next item on the agenda is item six. Um, this is a request to change the zoning on property at 2407 Brasher Avenue to permit a specific plan um, for a accessory home recording studio. The subject property is highlighted in red and as a reminder, this was a case considered at your last meeting. Um, so I will try to be succinct with my presentation. Um, staff's recommendation um, is to disapprove uh, this was considered by the Planning Commission on January 26th. Um, the Planning Commission uh, voted to defer and directed staff to look at some additional items. Um, the first of those were to look more closely at the existing home occupation standards in the Metro Zoning Code um, to see if there was any means of this use aligning with those standards. Um, we did do that. We did confer with the Zoning Administrator um, and we weren't able to find a way to fit this in to the current language. Um, which does not allow for clients or patrons on site. Um, you also asked us to look at the likelihood of a policy change for this property. As a reminder, the, the policy um, is neighborhood maintenance, um, which is typically for residential uses. Um, and given the location of this property interior to the neighborhood in a, in a residential area, um, we would not be likely to support a change to a policy that allowed for more commercial uses. Um, so again, the current zoning is R6, which is intended for one and two family residential. Policy is neighborhood maintenance, um, more of a residential only policy. Um, these were the standards for that specific plan um, that we looked at last time. Again, just to allow the accessory recording studio use in addition to the, the residential zoning allowances. Um, a couple of limitations proposed by the applicant there. Um, we went through some history of recent bills considered by council related to home uses. Um, and generally staff's recommendation, um, although home-based businesses may support some goals of Nashville Next, um, it's best considered on a countywide basis. Um, and this particular proposal is not consistent with the intent of an SP for a context sensitive development. So we recommend disapproval. <coughs> Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and open up the public hearing, and the applicant will have 10 minutes. You can come state your name and address. Yeah, uh, uh, Vice Chair and, and members of the commission, my name is Elijah Shaw, and I live at 2407 Brasher Avenue. And um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate some of the things that I communicated last time. Um, I'm here to ask for a rezoning application for permission to be able to work from my home studio. Um, it's what I it's what I do for a living, and it's what I'd like to be able to do for my home. Um, I'm a single dad. I support uh, my daughter, and this is how I make my living. It's how I would be, be able to survive and support support my daughter. So it's a good choice for me, and it um, would not have any impact on my neighborhood. There would be no change to my residence. There would be no change to the residential quality of my home or to the neighborhood. Um, so I don't don't ask to change anything. What I do is private. It's totally soundproofed, and um, any car that I would park there, I've got I've got room for that right there in my driveway. Um, 
I also have overwhelming support of my neighbors on all sides. So I had submitted a petition with 17 signatures. Um, I'd submitted six personal letters written by my neighbors in support of what I was asking for. And last, in the last meeting, there were four neighbors who were here uh, who had shown up in support. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say was just to kind of uh, encourage us all to consider that, you know, we, we live here in Music City, and what I'm asking to do is to be able to make music in Music City, um, making music uh, respectfully from home recording studios is a, a tradition here, I think, and it's one that I'm just asking permission to do. Um, what I'm good at doing is, uh, for, for a way to make a living, is to record local musicians making music, and the best way for me to do that is to put a microphone in front of one of them in my studio, and that's what I'm asking to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, George Dean, Two and Inch White, uh, 315 Dedrick Street. Uh, uh, we were here last time. I won't bore you with the uh, full presentation, but uh, just briefly, um, uh, no changes to the physical structure. Uh, the request would allow a small number of customers to come uh, for, to the recording studio. Um, the whole idea here is that it's not a commercial use. It's an accessory. Home occupation was an accessory to the residential use of the property. Accessory uses generally are incidental and subordinate to the principal use on the property. Here, the principal use is residential. This will be a small uh, uh, part of the overall property, much smaller than the residential that's there. Uh, the um, uh, home occupation won't have any impact on the surrounding land uses. Uh, for those of you who were here last time, most everybody, I guess, uh, there are a number of people here in support of uh, Mr. Shaw's neighbors uh, who had no problem with it. In fact, the only person who testified um, in opposition was kind of a, a forward-looking opposition. He didn't have any problem with Mr. Shaw at all and thought that he would do a fine job. Um, the uh, parking is available on the property, no signage. Uh, he'd rely on online contacts, uh, limited hours, and again, just no opposition, uh, no adverse impact on the surrounding land uses. Uh, again, surely a music recording studio fits in as a home occupation in Music City, USA. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Councilman. Commissioners fellow council member. Um, thank you for volunteering your time, staff, members. Thank you for staying here extra hours um, without any overtime pay. Um, I'm Councilman Davis. This is my district. This one is very tough for me. I am in support. This, this, this person has lived on this street for over 20 years, never been a problem. The person in opposition loves the neighbor and cares about him, we are trying to work out a solution among neighbors that live in this area. I have not had a chance to present him with an idea. So this, I'm trying to take a neutral position. If the planning commission, you know, please do not, you know, judge this case, because A, number one, you know, even though we know that we all have great relationships, we all care about each other, sometimes the outside world sees a disapproval you know, as, ha, ah, it's Councilman Davis challenging the commission again, you know. But I do what I must to try to help my neighbors, especially a single dad raising a child by himself. And what I would like to do is we think we have an alternative. Uh, we looked on Douglas to look at some other more commercial streets. Even though the Diesel College has a lot of commercial units, which is right down the road from there, we're trying to figure out a way to work this out, maybe through some other stuff. But I have, I've been getting lots of calls, home people who have home-based businesses that are scared right now because, you know, even though some folks who fear that putting commercial or having a commercial use, such as a beauty salon, when you cut your niece's hair or something, or if you're doing taxes for your neighbors out of your house, you know, I'm having a meeting coming up, and I have a lot of home-based businesses especially East Nashville with recording studios. And I don't have the time. I know you have the time, but you're saints, you know, to sit up here till midnight sometimes. You know, but, but to, to fight this issue again, you know, when this is Music City, you know, I want to try and find an alternate solution so we don't have to come back here. 
okay? Because I'll be honest, you know, you know, the STR folks who are for and against, they're great people. Some are neighbors of mine on both sides, but this has nothing to do with the STRs, I feel. I know some people here are here to speak, you know, because they have legitimate fears, you know, but allow me to help my neighbors with another solution, please. And more importantly right now is, you know, we think we may have a solution, but he's, but we have to work with our neighbor and his attorney and with the neighbors, even the one in opposition. Let this neighborhood stay healthy and work this problem out. You know, I know the Planning Commission, you guys are great, you, do, you solve a lot of issues, but I think we can solve this one without a no or yes with, with you because, you know, I have a lot of home-based businesses, a lot of people who do recording and even people who teach music lessons gearing up here in East Nashville, you know, to join the STRP fight on whatever side they are, and it doesn't need to happen. You know, and you may see what does this have to do with it, but the home-based business stuff is pretty touchy right now in all fields, and I am not trying to have my neighbors in the middle of this fight where me, you, and all of us have volunteered for this. You know what I mean? So let East Nashville try to solve its problems first. And this is not even a problem. Everybody loves this gentleman. You know, the one person opposition, the six neighbors that signed the petition, the four that came or two that came and spoke, you know, last last couple of weeks, let us try and solve this issue. You know, and, and you know, everybody loves the music. We love Music City, you know, but let us try to do what's best for him as neighbors. And I just appreciate the cooperation with codes and planning and trying to help find a solution for this gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and open this up. Is there anyone here speaking in support of the project? Anybody speaking in opposition? Please line up uh, behind the sign or come, first person can come up and then anyone else speaking in opposition should line up. And you'll have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Charlotte Cooper, 3409 Trimble Road. Uh, I was watching the replay of the January 26th meeting, and when I heard the public hearing was going to be reopened, it caught my attention and brought me out and several other people out today. Uh, I'm not a fan of SP zoning. I think the intent was good, but unfortunately, individuals try to use it as a loophole and abuse it. Uh, this has happened too many times over the last few years, and regrettably, Sometimes it has worked, even though you as a commission have disapproved the request. So hopefully today, I hope you will vote no again. Um, residential neighborhoods need to stay residential. Residents need some assurance when they invest in a home in a residential neighborhood, it will stay residential. The majority of us, and probably yourselves, purchased homes in a residential neighborhood for what it represents, a safe environment in which to raise children, a place to relax and enjoy peace and quiet, and to be among neighbors who share these common values and goals. Having businesses in residential neighborhoods disrupt the very nature of residential. If an individual wants to live where they work, there are districts zoned for that. Commercial, mixed use, and even some industrial zone districts allow residential. But please don't turn the tables and say residential should allow commercial businesses. Whatever you call these businesses, live work, um, <clears throat> home-based, home occupation, home businesses, they are still a commercial type of business where they are serving customers, clients, transients coming into our residential neighborhoods. We have certainly seen the negative impact of short-term rental businesses in our residential neighborhoods. Nashville is more than music and tourism, so please protect neighborhoods and make Nashville, for the future, proud. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. I'm John Summers, 5000 Wyoming Avenue. I'm not speci speaking specifically to this zone change as much as the issue that 
that your discussions at the last meeting brought up about the home-based occupancy issues. And I wanted to give you a little bit of history even beyond Stuart Clifton's, uh, because when I was elected in 83, I'm actually older uh, in terms of this, in 83 when I was elected in East Nashville, we had grandfathered in beauty parlors in our neighborhood because the previous council had eliminated those from the zoning code. I think the staff has given you some history from about 19, um, uh, 2011 here, but consistently the council for the last 40 years has restricted you know, commercial uses in our residential neighborhoods, and that issue has re-emerged re in terms of the type two STRs. I want to come and say I thought the staff did an excellent analysis on what the role is of the home occupancy permit. I actually have one. You know, it's so you can have an office in your home but not have any customers. And, and former Councilman um, Clifton and I actually jockeyed back and forth in the occupancy ordinance which you're relying upon now was the compromise that he and I reached somewhere between um, 87 and 91. So uh, this has stood the test of time. You've had, you've had proposals come before you to change it and they've been voted down and they've not just been voted down closely, they've been voted down significantly. Even as a respected council member as Michael Jamison got beat three to one when he tried to broaden this. We lose the perspective is that while we want to help people in business, we're also putting people in competition with other businesses. If you allow me as a lawyer to open an office and have customers about a house, I undercut the price that Mr. Dean and others who have offices, who pay taxes, who pay commercial rate. And so what you're doing is you're creating an uneven playing field if you open these up, these residential neighborhoods up to competing businesses. And that's really what we've got with STRs. They're competing with our hotel and motel industry. And so I would urge you to maintain the current standards that we have for occupational, home occupational. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Grace Renshaw. I live at 220 Mockingbird Road, and I also own a long-term rental property at 1607A Douglas Avenue in East Nashville that my husband and I rent to our daughter. My understanding of the purpose of specific plan zoning was to give developers more flexibility. If that flexibility means introducing some residential units into a commercial building in a commercial zone, which would potentially allow residents to walk to work, I'm all for it, but Mr. Shaw proposes to do the opposite. He wants to operate a freestanding commercial enterprise in a residential neighborhood. His lot in a residential neighborhood would effectively come, become a freestanding commercial zone surrounded by R6 zoning. I hope the Planning Commission will not allow the use of specific plan zoning as a tool that people who want to construct or run a business in a commercial neighborhood can use to do an end run around residential or any other type of zoning. I live in Cherokee Park and my lot is approximately 0.2 of an acre. Mr. Shaw's lot is 0.23 acres, roughly the same size. I can't imagine how I would run a commercial business on my tiny lot, have people coming and going, and not have that be somehow disruptive to neighbors. I think Mr. Uh, Shaw is a nice guy. His neighbors obviously like him, but that doesn't mean his property should be exempt from residential zoning requirements. Please take your staff's recommendation and disapprove this request. I'd also like you to think really hard about the lawyer's use of accessory use in this instance. I feel like the short-term rental law sort of abused the definition of accessory use and okay. that, that set Thank a you. precedent that you may seeing, be seeing again. Thank you. And I would like to ask that we do stick as close as we can to the item that we're discussing, which is um, not the short-term rental issue tonight. I'm Joe Hamilton. I live at 305 Mountainside Drive, which is just off Harding Place. I'm here to support the staff's recommendation on disapproval. I travel all over the world, and people always ask me one question. What is it you like most about Nashville? For many years, I have told them the residential areas of Nashville are the nicest, best in any city I've ever visited in, and I don't want to see those destroyed by putting businesses in residential areas. I don't want to have to tell them the next time I visit, 
that whole idea has changed. People are just allowing this one, that one, this business, that business to enter into the residential areas. I don't understand how the owner of that property, he's been living there for 20 years. He must have been supporting himself and his daughter without having the accessory building to do recording in. So I don't understand why he says that he has to have that building to support himself because he obviously has been supporting himself for 20 years in the property. So my feeling is let's keep residential areas residential. That's an important goal. And once you allow the foot in the door of the camel, the next business comes along and it wants its leg in and the next business wants the whole camel in and the next business after that wants the camel's family in. And it just blossoms. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Janelle Hamilton. I also live at 305 Mountainside Drive with that guy. Uh, I oppose very much having commercialization of neighborhoods. I think we've seen things in recent years that are hurting neighborhoods, and uh, I think it's very important to protect them. Thank you. Hi, Planning Commissioners. Councilmember Allen. Uh, my name is Teresa McLaughlin. I live at 1300 Shelby Avenue in East Nashville, part of the area that's affected. I love music. It's one of the huge reasons I moved to Nashville. We love the live music. Uh, we know lots of musicians. Um, but I do uh, want you to take the staff recommendation, disapprove the zoning change uh, to an SP. I also believe firmly that businesses should be in commercially zoned areas, not in R or RS zoned districts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you all, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm John Stern and I'm here as the current president of the Nashville Neighborhood Alliance. Um, some of the folks that uh, have come up here today have been uh, wonderful members of our current planning and zoning committee, which now boasts over 110 people. Um, back when we rewrote the code, I think Commissioner Clifton was around back then, uh, we actually uh, were in a completely different environment than we are today. Uh, neighborhoods were not considered to be important and commercial zoning was of maximum regard. Uh, in that environment, we fought tooth and nail to keep commercial intrusions into residential districts uh, out. And once in a while, they come up again, um, this one, a recording studio. The last time recording studio came up, uh, we had to have an intensive effort contacting council members and it was disapproved in mass, if I don't remember correctly. It's nothing against uh, the owner of the property or his family. Uh, we just, in general, believe that the commercialization of neighborhoods is a bad thing and hope that you will keep that in your hearts as you look at these proposals moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else speaking in opposition? Um, so the applicant, you'll have two minutes to, for rebuttal. Um, <clears throat> Elijah Shaw, 2407 Brasher. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, the commercialization of the neighborhood. Again, I don't really want to change anything about the nature of my neighborhood. I want to. I want to just be able to live and work from my home and improve it and improve the quality of life there by being a conscientious, respectful neighbor that is keeping an eye on the neighborhood by being there. Um, some some particular points. You know, the idea of the neighborhood um, being a safe place for children. I'm the one on our street who has raised a daughter riding her bike up and down Brasher Avenue right there. I'm the one who put up um, 
go children slow signs in my neighborhood to try and help s keep the traffic from speeding through. It's, um, you know, it's had nothing to do with commercialism. The traffic is occasionally comes flying down our street. And uh, so it is very much in my interest to keep it a safe place to be. Um, the idea of I guess, I guess one topic I wanted to address was the, the 20 year question. And uh, the music business has really changed a lot in the 20 years um, that I've been here. And it has, the, the larger scale record labels and commercial recording studios and job opportunities aren't there in the same way that they once were. And it has really evolved towards a place of um, figure out how to do it yourself and figure out how to, to um, make your own living in music. And that's really what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to participate in the local music community, which is also trying to do that. So I just ask for your understanding with those things. And I also appreciate everybody's points and everybody's uh, um, ability to share their considerations. So thank you. Thank you very much. I will declare the public hearing closed um, and go ahead and open it up. But we do want to just confirm for the record, Commissioner Haynes, I know you were not here last time, but you watched the video. Great. Thank you. Um, well, Commissioner Clifton, I don't want to put you on the spot again as the first, but you have been mentioned quite a few times. Yes. Uh, <laughs> when I founded Metro Government, uh, <laughs> you would think I was pretty old, but you know, I'm just uh, 33. It's just been a tough few years. Um, I have evolved a little bit in my thoughts about this over the years, and I guess um, I still think neighborhoods and neighborhood associations have saved this city, frankly, from, from a time when, um, when I first became a council member, when it was, as some have said, neighborhoods were, were not paid any attention to whatsoever uh, by the council as a whole and by the commission, frankly. Um, so we've come a long way. Uh, <laughs> my, my the reason I have such trouble with this issue, although I have no trouble with what, what we need to do today, um, is that I grew up at a time, I was a Nashvillian at a time when we, we forbade uh, residential living in downtown Nashville and almost all of it. You just couldn't do it. It was illegal. We had to keep them all separate. We don't do that anymore. There's still some, some examples, but that's what we did. And, and the fact that we now have um, Mixed use, which is a different thing than SP, but we have mixed use uh, both um, as an official category, but also uh, just in how we look at downtown and look at other places. That to me has been good for the city, uh, but it's been, un it's been done admittedly under very specific, clear guidelines and not ad hoc, which is what this proposal is. Uh, it's an ad hoc type thing that we would be establishing a, a precedent for, I'm afraid, since we haven't been able to come up with an overarching uh, um, principle that would allow us to do it as a matter of, of um, anything other than a one-by-one -one decision. I also grew up at a time, and I think it's still the case, uh, I'm not sure if Metro Legal has had a particular question about this over the years, but uh, what, what, uh, what occupations can actually be done right now in neighborhoods that are residential? Well, well What's addressed here is the home occupation as an accessory use. Right. It doesn't outline other things. Yeah. Specific occupations that can, you know, happen at the residence. It it just says that no clients or patrons may be served on the property, among other things. Mm -hmm. But that was, I believe, um, what we got caught up on at the last meeting was the clients or patrons. Yeah. Piece. Does the code still allow? people to take piano lessons in residential neighborhoods, because it always has. So, unless it got changed, did it get taken out? I'm not, I'm, I'm not aware, but, but um, if it's your home occupation and your, and home occupation is an accessory use, the code says that clients or patrons cannot be served on the property. I guess that depends on the definition of accessory use. But, but it may be news to folks, but that actually has been in a, uh, for many years uh, uh, an obvious exception, I guess. 
All that aside, I, I do I do side with those who who think we we are a better community because we have at least some zoning categories where we can mix uses. Um, I had hoped and and sort of raising some questions at our last meeting that we might come up with some magical answer that would would do more than make this just a uh, an ad hoc decision based on whether we like the story of the person who wanted the the decision. But we haven't been able to do that. And and the dangers of opening the door to to using the SP every time someone has a, a situation are too great for us to go with. As, as sympathetic as this situation might be, um, and as much as I, I think we as a community are better off by having um, businesses and residences in close proximity, when we have made that decision as a body, I can't, I, I don't think we have any choice about what to do today. So that's where I am. Bob, did you have, you look like you wanted to interject about something. I was just going to say, I don't, I don't know of any exemptions for piano lessons or things like that it's in, in the code, but. <laughs> it, it can be under personal instruction, okay. under education. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's good to know. Maybe but it's, it's not in residential, so. <laughs> okay, Commissioner Diaz. Okay, I've been thinking about this for like since the last time we, you know, talk, spoke about it. Um, and I, the last time we saw this, I think, I believe that I was thinking, you know, I said it would be great if we had a larger conversation, something that we could all agree on as a city. Um, and now thinking about it, um, it comes down to policy to me. And we have policies that allow certain uses and certain zoning for a reason. Um, and T3 neighborhood maintenance or neighborhood maintenance is probably one of the only ones that protect residential policy from any type of um, commercial use. Whether or not you agree with the definition of a commercial use, technically this is a commercial use because of the patron or you know, client thing. Um, so I wanted to ask, just for, for clarification, the staff, if T4 Neighborhood Evolving allowed live work, because technically I think, is this considered live work by the policy terms or the? So T4 Neighborhood Maintenance Policy does not specifically support live work. It would not be consistent with the policy. Um, if you were to meet the, the definition of a home occupation, which in the code is an accessory to a residential use, that would not be inconsistent because the it's defined as accessory to the residential, right. which is supported. My question is, um, for example, does T3 or neighborhood evolving, does that policy allow live work? Or what other residential policies allow live work? No, the, the neighborhood evolving is a purely residential policy, so it does not allow for the commercial uses to be introduced right. into that. Okay. Um, so what is the next step, I guess? What's the next policy for what allow, would allow something like this? I'm not exactly sure uh, if transition transition policy would allow residential and office uses, but the recording studio, no, that you probably have to put in neighborhood center policy, and that's what or mixed use neighborhood, which I don't know that you could just put it down in one one spot. You know, you'd have to right <laughs> zone look at a larger logical policy area. Change. Yeah, right. So I think to me, like I was mentioning before, it comes down to the policy, and this does not meet the policy that we have in place. And it seems like it's even far fetched from being close to being allowed by a policy that's residential. So I think. For me, I can't, I can't support it. Um, I think it, it have to be a complete, you know, whole city change, you know, something that we all agree on. But for this case specifically, I can't say that I, um, I can approve it. Council lady. 
Thank you. Um, I appreciate all the comments before me and uh, echo a lot of Council Member Clifton's and I, and I certainly appreciate the extra work that staff did trying to help us think this through thoroughly. I mean, I think it has been good to sort of clarify some of the questions and, and there's certainly no question that, that uh, Mr. Shaw's neighbors think very highly of him and, and have shown really strong support. I guess another thing about why an SP is, is not an okay way is it stays with the property and if Mr. Shaw ends up moving, then who knows who moves in there and, and, and then we've, you know, we've put something in place that, um, that is no longer dependent on that wonderful person and his, and his sweet family being there. Um, so that, that makes the SP, I think, yet one more reason why that's, that's um, unfortunately not the tool that we need. Um, so as much as we've, you know, kind of struggled with how do we keep the music in Music City, I don't think we've, we've come upon the tool yet. And I know Council Member, um, Davis is, look, is looking for a way to solve the problem, and I'm hoping maybe he's got another trick in his back pocket that he's going to bring out, but it, do, it doesn't seem like we're there with this yet. And um, I mean, I appreciate the extra time we took to see if we could try to make it fit within things that we have all agreed to, and it seems clear to me that we haven't, so I'm, I'm going to have to just agree with the staff recommendation. Thank you. Commissioner Tibbs. I agree with everything that's been said. Okay. Commissioner Hagendeer. I'm going to say I don't want to belabor points, and then I'm going to belabor points, um, but not really. I, I think it's interesting. I was just sitting here thinking, as an attorney, we sometimes pick cases to float to judges to see what kind of analysis we're going to get, and it seems this we focused on in a <coughs> music city and a recording studio, and it's a great something you want to approve of, um, but then we've gotten some feedback on that was straight into the short-term rental world. And there's, so this is a bigger piece than one piece of property back to your policy thing. And this has all been discussed. Not a tool in our toolkit. It's not within the policy. It's a bigger change. Um, we have a beauty shop coming up and then the same thing. It's, these are very, you wanna, you we wanna appreciate the people wanna work from home. You appreciate the, you know, who are we to tell them they can't do it? It's the American way, right? Um, but what if it was something you didn't like, like a tattoo parlor, which I love, but some people don't. You know, you can't see them, but they're there. Um, you know, what if it was something else that wasn't exactly music in the city? So we as a body have to look at these things beyond the, the scope of the per exact facts in front of us. So that's all I wanted to do is put on the record that I agree with the staff's recommendation despite the specific situation. Thank you. Commissioner Haynes? Um, I too agree with staff's recommendation. I, I do think as a city we need to figure this out mm -hmm. because in this particular situation, this gentleman has asked us for permission. He could have not asked us for permission, continued to do business in his dwelling. Um, in my neighborhood, Big Kenny's got a huge recording studio. He doesn't charge anybody. He makes music out of it. He doesn't have permission to do it. And there's so many examples all over Nashville where they don't ask permission. They have a lot more money. They go ahead and put the recording studios in and they ask for forgiveness. So I think this is an issue that we've got to solve as a city long term. Yeah, I reluctantly agree with his staff and it's only because of the like commissioner mm -hmm. the, the commented we we want to do this we want a it's american way we want to support these people and i guess where it becomes commercial if i'm at home making calls to sell items and making a living there that's not commercial i suppose but then if one person comes and performs a function and we make money, then it becomes commercial, I suppose, is, is kind of the, the fine line. And I think it, we do need to study this, uh, John and Stuart. Y'all were working on this years ago, and now here we are today. Still hadn't got it resolved, but we're closer, hopefully. Um, you know, the councilman that spoke earlier, Councilman Davis, is, is the most passionate councilman that I can recall that really works. 
I, I know he works every day and probably eight to ten hours every day and on the weekends wanting to improve his district, wanting to improve his constituents' lives, and there's a lot of laws that we have to adhere to that keeps him from doing that. And that, that I want to support him just about every time he comes up here because he's so passionate. Uh, in this particular case, I'll be voting with the, with the staff, but um, I urge us or the staff or the council or whoever to look at this and try to come back. You know, the, what you talked about earlier, Stuart, the piano teacher or a, or a tutor in their home that is a child that comes that's maybe needing some help, but they come once a week, one child, so now it's commercial. And that tutor can't afford to have a hundred dollar a week office or telephone and stuff, so it it, it, it kind of rubs against what we're trying to do the American way to be able to help somebody. Now there's limitations; you can't have a recording studio or a salon and have twelve bays, and you know there's and and that's a fine line. It's hard to define. So rather than belabor it, I just have said what I said, but I'm going to go with the staff, but very reluctantly for the for the audience and for the councilman and for the staff that I think I have no other choice, but it's not one that I cherish in making. Thank and I, you. At this time, I'll just make a recommendation or a, a um, motion to uh, just to go with staff recommendation, which disapproves and um, doing that with a heavy heart. Second. I think I just wanted to sort of say for the record too that, uh, that the issue really is the use of the specific plan. And we hear so often that this is a planning decision and this is a legislative decision and sometimes we blur the lines. But in this situation, it's very clearly a planning decision. How do we choose to apply the specific plan? And I am with you, I'm with a heavy heart because I feel like this is, he's trying to do the right thing and I would like to support that. Um, and if it came forward in a different route, I would certainly support it. But using a specific plan, unfortunately, while well, I don't know that the, there's another option in place right now, that's not the way to go about for us to approve doing it. Um, any other, other comments? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, we spoke what we said about the recording studio. The beauty salon is going to come up, and I don't see that. I mean, we're willing to have the public hearing if the applicant would, wants to go ahead, but I would ask them if they would be willing to defer until such time that they have defer? that they have some um, possibility of getting it approved. I don't see that it's going to be tonight and uh, to not take up the time of the audience that's trying to get their um, cases heard and, and our time too. So it didn't, if the applicant for, uh, you'd have to do that as chair lady, but uh, that on item seven, if they'd be willing to defer indefinitely until there's a time that have a possibility of getting it approved. Yeah, and I understand the comment I, and and really, uh, if the I guess what I want to say, uh, George Dean for the applicant, um, is that we'd prefer to get a vote. If um, uh, I recognize that it's not going to pass, uh, uh, and there's been a hearing and the, uh, open public hearing last time, I'm glad to just go with that. If the commission wants to do that, don't want to waste the commission's time because obviously it's a fait accompli is what's going to happen. Um, uh, so. The, the all, rather than not, rather than defer it, I'd rather have it voted on. Um, uh, but I'm willing to just go with the hearing from last time. Uh, and, and I don't want to cut out the neighbors. Uh, I know uh, John Summers, John Stearns here. Uh, from my standpoint, if you just wanted to use the comments for the from the previous hearing as their comments for this hearing, so as they've got a, they've been able to say what they wanted to say. That way, it would not waste your time. It would get what I need, which is basically an action from the planning commission, and we'd all be reasonably happy anyway. Okay. If, if that makes any sense. That makes sense. Um, 
So how do we procedurally? Uh, let me, um, as a former chair, I, I may be, I wasn't real Please. clear on what I was supposed to do when I was chair anyway, so I'll probably embarrass myself even more. <laughs> but I, I would make a motion that if there's no exception from the audience that they would like to have a public hearing, because if someone wants to have a public hearing, then we will would honor that. But if no one in the audience speaks up for a public hearing, that we close a public hearing, and I'll make a motion to disapprove the staff recommendations on item uh, seven. Okay. Uh, I need a second from someone on the commission. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll ask in the audience, is there anyone out there who would like us to go ahead and hold a public hearing on this item? Okay. Just incorporating his remarks into the record suffices. Okay. We can do that. Is that legally okay? It is. It's your meeting, and uh, actually the public hearing isn't required on, on these matters. It's just uh, our policy to have Okay. Well, then I will go ahead and ask for a, um, we got a motion, a, a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And just to reapprove, we're disapproving item seven. Okay. Thank you. I think we're going to go ahead and take a little break before we get into the last few items. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> on this evening's agenda is a request for concept plan approval to create two lots on property at 2811 Wimbledon in the Green Hills area. The subject property is highlighted in red. Staff recommendation is to disapprove. The current zoning on the property is primarily R10. There's a small area of R20 zoning at the south end of the property. Um, both of those zoning districts are intended for single family dwellings and duplexes with a minimum lot size of either 10,000 square feet or 20,000 square feet respectively. The policy for the area is T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance, which is intended to preserve the general character of developed suburban residential neighborhoods. Staff does not find that the proposal provides for harmonious development consistent with the existing character and development pattern of this portion of the neighborhood, and thus that it is inconsistent with the policy. This is the proposed concept plan. It is for two lots. Lot one, which is the lot to the north, is about 42,000 square feet in size with frontage on Wimbledon Road. Lot two, um, which is about 32,900 square feet in size with frontage on Hilldale. If approved, the existing home on the property would be removed. Um, I would note that although the, the plan shows these lots labeled as two family lots, that determination would be made by codes. Um, and if approved, sidewalks would be constructed on both Wimbledon and Hilldale. Uh, because this is a neighborhood maintenance policy, um, there are specific standards in the subdivision regulations um, for reviewing infill subdivisions. Mm -hmm. Um, that we need to look at for this. Uh, the first is that the proposed lots meet the minimum standards of the zoning code, and in this case they do. Um, the second is that is the lots would have frontage along a public street. Um, this is a concept plan, but if this were to be approved, Hilldale Drive would be constructed along the, the frontage of the property. It's not built today for the full length, um, and that would meet the public street frontage requirement. Uh, we also look at um, other aspects of compatibility, such as lot frontage. Um, I would note for the discussion of compatibility um, that it's determined based on surrounding parcels, and the subdivision regs specifically define um, what qualifies as a surrounding parcel, and that would be the five R, R, A, R, S, or R, S, A zoned parcels oriented to the same block face on either side of the parcel to be divided, or to the end of the block face, whichever is less. Um, so that's the definition we used in identifying which parcels to analyze. So for lot frontage, the, the proposed lots must either have frontage equal to or greater than 70% of the average frontage of those surrounding parcels, mm -hmm. 
or equal to or greater to the surrounding lot with the least frontage, whichever is greater. Um, the subregs also direct us how to review corner lots, and for frontage, um, we we look only um, on the block face to which that lot is oriented. So that's how we've looked at, at proposed lot one, which is a, a corner lot. So um, for lot one, we analyzed the surrounding parcels along Wimbledon east of Hilldale. Um, and we did find that lot one meets compatibility for frontage. Lot two, which is oriented, I mean, excuse me, along Wimbledon. Lot two, which is oriented towards Hilldale, um, does not have anything, no surrounding lots with which to compare it. We also looked at lot area. Um, again, 70% of the average of the surrounding parcels or um, equal to or greater than the surrounding lot with the least area, whichever is greater. Again, for a corner lot, we only look at the block face to which the lot is oriented. Um, so for lot one, we looked along Wimbledon, east of Hilldale. Um, for lot two, there was nothing meeting um, the definition of surrounding with which to compare it. Um, lot one does meet compatibility. Finally, we look at street setbacks and lot orientation. Um, corner lots are treated differently by the subdivision regs for these two standards than for frontage and area. Um, in this case, for corner lots, you look at both block faces. Um, there is a 90-foot setback along Wimbledon um, average, and so lot one is consistent with that and with the orientation of lots along Wimbledon. The required setback is shown on the plat. Um, again, with lot two, there's nothing to compare. Um, and all reviewing agencies have recommended approval. Um, so because um, lot two does not have parcels with which it can be compared, um, we are here in front of the Planning Commission for you to evaluate. Um, Hilldale Drive separates this lot um, from the western part of the neighborhood where smaller lots are more typical. Uh, the proposal is not consistent with the development pattern east of Hilldale and south of Wimbledon. Uh, the commission may consider whether the proposal provides for harmonious development by considering the development pattern of a larger area. But staff finds that it does not provide for harmonious development with this portion of the neighborhood um, east of Hilldale and south of Wimbledon and therefore recommends disapproval. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the commission, Madam Chairperson. My name is Jason Holloman with the West Nashville Law Group, and I'm here today on behalf of the applicant. Um, I would like to reserve two minutes of my time for rebuttal after, um, after the opponents have a chance to speak. I think it's important to begin this by reminding the commission what I, I know that all of you know, but when you uh, apply the subdivision regulations, you sit quasi-judicially and you have an obligation to apply those regulations to this particular piece of property and, and no more. Um, this is not the same kind of policy um, or community input type of process that you have in some rezoning uh, recommendations. It is simply the application of the subdivision regulations to this particular piece of property. As you see when you look through the staff analysis, um, I don't think we have any question uh, that we have lot comparability both in terms of frontage and in terms of area with the block face there on Wimbledon, which um, as the staff report says, uh, to determine based on surrounding parcels, and surrounding parcels is defined as either the, the lesser of either the block face or five in either direction. So in this particular case, that block face has three other parcels that front Wimbledon. And if you see, 70% of the average, which is what the subdivision regulations require, is 0.79 acres. Both of these properties are significantly larger than 0.79 acres. And again, there's not an issue as to whether the front lot there on Wimbledon meets comparability. The issue is about the back lot, lot two. And I want to be very clear that no one is saying that there is lot comparability analysis that indicates that this lot is not comparable. It's just simply that because Hilldale ends, as you can see the end of the road there right in front of lot two, um, there aren't other lots on that particular block face to do this calculation. That's the issue here. And so what the subregs tell us 
when there's not sufficient lots on the block face to do that comparability analysis, we look at a larger area. Now, the term larger area is not defined in your subdivision regulations. So what we've tried to do is show you a few slides of the adjacent parcels several different ways to give you a feel and to give you the mathematical calculation of what is comparable uh, in the nearby block faces. So if we, could, if we could run through those slides. The first slide is, like I said, Wimbledon, and that just demonstrates uh, that lot one, as staff and the applicant agree is comparable. If we can go to the second slide. In green throughout all these slides is going to be the two lots that we are proposing here as part of the subdivision. In blue are going to be the ones that are analyzed in the black box there. When you look across Wimbledon at the nearest four lots, on the other side of Wimbledon, you'll see that actually the average, not 70% of the average, which is what the subdivision regulations tell us to take, but the average is 0.71, which is smaller than either of the two lots proposed. 70% of the average is a half acre, which is actually half the size of one of these proposed lots. If we could go to the next slide. Then looking to the, to the west, as was referenced, um, there is unquestionably a smaller lot pattern to the west, um, but I note that the staff report actually says staff does not find that the proposed subdivision is generally in character with the surrounding development pattern. The existing lot continues the development pattern of the properties along the same block face to the east. Well, here to the west, those are all roughly quarter acre lots. Everything that we're proposing is much closer to an acre, at least three times as large as, as those lots. Now, also keep in mind that this property, as we go through these slides, is zoned R10. Um, those are quarter acre minimum lot size. Now, we understand this is neighborhood maintenance, and so comparability does apply, but if you simply applied base zoning to this particular piece of property, with the R10 zoning, it would actually yield seven available lots. We're asking for two in this particular context. If we could go to the next slide. Again, this is a similar analysis looking at the opposite corner of Wimbledon, and you'll see when you take those four lots together, most of them are roughly a quarter acre as well. The average is 0.27, which again is a third the size of the smallest lot we proposed, when you get down to 70%, it's about a fourth of the smallest lot we propose. Next slide. Then again, looking at what I would say uh, meets a reasonable definition of the larger area, we're looking at all four corners and down on both sides the, of, of Wimbledon uh, between Hilldale and up to Woodmont. And looking at all of those together, you see that the average, again, 100%, not the 70% as required by the subdivision regulations, the 100% is 0.59, which is, again, uh, significantly smaller than the two lots that we propose as part of the subdivision. Next slide. And this is our final slide. I mean, I, I think it would be hard to envision a larger area definition, um, much larger than this, in looking for lot comparability. Uh, this includes several of the larger lots. It includes some of the smaller lots. Frankly, it includes more to the east than it does to the west. When you do this analysis, your average is 0.74, which again is significantly smaller than either of the resulting lots from this subdivision. When you take 70% of it, it's 0.52, roughly half an acre. One of ours is 0.97, again, almost twice as large. So when you take that information and you apply it to the subdivision regulations, the subdivision regulations direct you to take 70% of a larger area to determine comparability. And in doing that, we don't see how this subdivision of two parcels uh, from what is 1.76 acres of land into two almost acre lots in R10 zone property doesn't meet lot comparability. So with that, we submit um, that we do meet the necessary requirements for subdivision. 
Um, I would like to introduce my client, Mr. Halloran, uh, who owns this property, who has developed some of the adjacent property, um, and I'd like for him to tell you a little bit about the community process. Again, not really directly before you, but because there are people here from the community, I would like for him to explain to you briefly what he's done to try to engage the community on this issue. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Halloran, um, native Nashvilleian. Uh, grew up in the neighborhood, still live in the area. Um, I'm trying to split this thing up where we don't have a lot of density, uh, given plenty of room between the houses, considering a lot of projects that are going on in that neighborhood. And I just feel that this is very uh, fair for everybody. Um, I'm doing the, uh, the uh, spot next door that is an R20 zone property that we're, we actually have five homes going on there. Um, but uh, we, we don't want to, you know, get too heavy on this. If you want to reserve your two minutes, we should. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have anyone here speaking in support of this project? Okay. And those that are speaking in opposition, if you could line up. Our people are speaking in opposition. Um, you'll each have two minutes, and I'd ask you to state your name and address. And just for the, in the interest of kind of keeping the meeting moving, um, if, if your comment is going to be the same as the person right in front, we'll just kind of try to keep moving as quickly as we can. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Ellen Tanner. My husband, Hugh, who unfortunately is traveling, was not able to be here and would love to. We live at 3301 Wimbledon, directly west of the proposed development across Hilldale. While I haven't lived in that neighborhood as long as I, many others that are here with us this evening, we've only lived there three and a half years. We knew when we first looked at our house it was the one we wanted. We love the quiet, narrow streets where neighbors walk. They push strollers, children ride bikes, and the short dead end our driveway is on is, a, is unbelievable, especially the mature trees. We also love the block just to our east with the larger lots. Always better not to have the largest home, correct? This house was to be our last home. I must admit, prior to buying this house, and investing significantly in a remodel, my husband visited the planning department just to reassure us that we were not getting into a major development zone. And he was assured that there would be a process for any approvals to redevelop the opposite two corners and that it did not appear that much if any additional development was possible. We were willing to take the chance because the neighborhood was that attractive to us. That being said, the proposed development will d result in a drastic change to the neighborhood and the stated <laughs> policy for growth calls for neighborhood maintenance. The 110 foot dead end street would go from having four driveways to nine driveways. How out of place would the only sidewalk to nowhere look? The addition of four new homes, which is what the decision to grant this subdivision will allow will create a much more dense development that is inconsistent with the surrounding look and feel of the established neighborhood, as you can see. And given that there are not any other homes to compare Lot 2 on Hilldale with in Thank terms you. of frontage. Thank okay. you. Uh, could you put the slide up that had the purple and the blue? and? And can you state your name and address while she's pulling that up? I'm Marietta Shipley, um, and I am the neighbor. Um, if you see the two green ones, I'm to the right of that, 2809 Wimbledon Road. So I'm a direct neighbor to this, to this property. And I have lived on Wimbledon for about 40 years. I've lived in two houses on Wimbledon. Um, and it is a wonderful little sort of secret street next to Woodmont. And what is unique about this is on my, on my end of the street, they're all large houses on large pieces of property. 
And Dr. Jones, who owned this one, this piece of property, as well as Dr. Wright across the street, they were single homeowners. And we always assumed that it would remain that way. The, the zoning on this street is really weird. I'm R40, across the streets, R10, R20. I don't know how it was all zoned that way. But this is the way the neighborhood was. And there have been no significant changes to the neighborhood except people buying a lot and having a large, a larger house built on it. This basically infill development is totally out of character for the neighborhood. We already have a problem because across the street, unbeknownst to the neighbor, our dear Dr. Wright managed to put uh, a range so he would have four houses on it so he could go to Cookville. He don't think he could have stayed in the same neighborhood. So we just think, I, I understand all the legal arguments for subdivisions, but according to the Green Hills plan, this is a neighborhood. Other infill can be on Wimbledon, I mean on Woodmont, but should not be on Wimbledon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm James Manning. I live at 2806 Wimbledon, Caddy Corner, and across the street from this project that's being proposed. My wife and I have lived there since 1999. I've lived in the general area since uh, Mayor Briley. I totally agree, and my wife totally agree, with the uh, decision of the, uh, of the Planning Commission staff. We totally disagree with this plan that will totally upset our neighborhood and, and the, the, the way we live in and walk and enjoy our streets. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Robert Took. I live at 3708 Wimbledon Road. Uh, have lived there uh, since 1983, um, down the hill from where this is. Uh, I want to thank every one of you for staying so late and for working so hard and to listening, uh, for listening to uh, the citizens of this fine city. Um, I completely agree with the planning commission staff, their analysis of it. This is still policy, uh, as you've just heard. I'm not going to reiterate it, except I, I would like to offer this to it. Um, because this is not a dense neighborhood, the children that live on this neighborhood, and one of the joys is to have new neighbors come into the neighborhood with their kids, and the kids uh, ride their bicycles and their skateboards. Um, and in the brief times when we still have snow uh, in Nashville, uh, they sled down Wimbledon Road toward where my house is. And when you add density, contrary to the policy uh, that the staff has commented, um, you put those kids at danger. Um, you change the neighborhood. and. I certainly hope, and my wife hopes, that you will take into account the, the sound policy that underlies holding a neighborhood like this uh, secure. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ann Whitaker, and I live at 3504 Graceswood Area Avenue, which is two streets down. Um, I've lived in this neighborhood for 35 years. I've seen it go from an older group of people and we're now seeing a resurgence of families with young children because of the Julia Green School District. Um, I am very concerned not only of stormwater, and I have wonderful pictures showing how bad stormwater is now because of the developments in our area, but because of the children. I've had a street that's gone from almost no children to two, four, six, eight, ten kids on my small street alone. This this developmental growth of a neighborhood ha has become almost unbearable because it's all about money. And I'm, I'm very sad about it. Our neighborhood is being destroyed. The two houses that have been built behind me so tower over the other homes, it's ridiculous. And um, I really hope that you all continue to disapprove this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Cooper, 3409 Trimble Road. As a board member of the Green Hills Neighborhood Association, we try to watch all items in District 25 and 34. 
It is of great concern to our members that requests such as this one are destroying the character of so many of our wonderful older neighborhoods. We as board members do understand why so many of our older neighborhoods had large lots with only one house. And for some of you who are very young, you may not realize, but it was septic tanks. And we no longer need those, and we understand that. However, those large lots created the character of our neighborhoods and the great demand to live there. Uh, already, some of the lots have multiple houses on them. And it seems like today, contractors and developers appear to um, give little consideration for character of neighborhood. They have no connection to these neighborhoods except for how much money they can make cramming multiple houses on these beautiful treed lots. Of course, they have to remove the trees first. Um, so please follow the staff recommendation and vote no since allowing the proposed subdivision will definitely not provide for a harmonious development within this wonderful neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. I'm David Stevenson and my wife Susan. We've lived on uh, about three houses down for, uh, she was moved here in the 70s and I was a little later, but uh, People buy these lots, and I don't blame people wanting to make money. It's what they do, they're builders. But they'll buy the lot before it's zoned, and then they hope they can get it rezoned because they're buying it at the price for two houses. And then they can add four, and that's their profit. And this seems to be going on, you know, everywhere where you see six houses behind another house, you know. <laughs> and uh, it's just doesn't fit. It certainly doesn't fit on our street, and I hope you all will follow the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here speaking in opposition? Okay, the applicant would like to come back up for the two minutes of rebuttal. Thank you, members of the commission. Jason Holloman again. Um, just a couple of quick points. Um, I know there was discussion about uh, the place for density is more on Woodmont. I do wanna be clear that this is why we divide uh, in our policy between neighborhood evolving and neighborhood maintenance. Again, this property is zoned R10, so if you were in neighborhood evolving, uh, you would probably be seeing a request for a seven lot subdivision plat. There could be seven lots under base zoning here. Um, what we're coming with is a two lot subdivision. Uh, I think there's a case to be made actually uh, looking at the larger area of comparability for a three lot subdivision in this case. But the applicant has chosen very specifically to come only with a two lot. Uh, and again, we believe that the appropriate decision here is to apply the analysis of the subdivision regulations, uh, which do show that this lot, both of the lots that would result, are compatible with the surrounding development patterns, including the development pattern uh, that was noted to the east of Hilldale to the south of Wimbledon, as was shown in the last slide. Finally, just to note, um, as the commission knows, uh, stormwater, of course, regulation has significantly increased, and there will be on-site rain gardens. We will meet all stormwater regulations, um, so I don't believe that's gonna be a concern with the subdivision. So with that, we ask for your approval for the subdivision. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll declare the public hearing closed. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Russ Pulley, I'm a council person for District 25, and I appreciate your time. Uh, I do want to uh, weigh in a little bit here. Um, I heard uh, a couple of things Mr. Holloman said that I want to take issue with. Um, first of all, I believe I heard him start off this uh, presentation to you stating that you're pretty much bound to uh, not pay attention to what they're saying to you, to, uh, that you're bound by the subdivision regulations. And then he goes on to make a very creative argument that the subdivision regulations are met in this instance. Um, and the averages that he uses in his calculations take into account the small lots on the east side of Hilldale and the large lots on the western, or excuse me, the, the small lots on the western part of Hilldale and the large lots on the east side of Hilldale. I believe that what you see there is a distinct break in the development 
character of that neighborhood, uh, where Hilldale divides the small lots for the large, from the large lots, and uh, the character of the lots on the east side of Hilldale are all large single family lots, and splitting this into two, I do not believe, I firmly believe that would not keep in the harmonious character of that neighborhood. And uh, to bring up base zoning in seven lots, I don't think anybody here believes that uh, a subdivision of that property in seven lots uh, is ever going to happen. So I don't think that's worth even discussing. So uh, uh, what I would say to you is uh, um, in keeping with the harmonious <laughs> development of this neighborhood, the neighborhood also has very small streets. Uh, it's not necessary to put a sidewalk to nowhere out there because there really isn't room for any of that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, what I would ask you is, you know, to his point initially, the subdivision, the infield subdivision regulations are not met by lot two, very clearly articulated by uh, uh, the planning staff here. So I would recommend that uh, you adhere to the decision of the staff and disapprove this recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry for the oversight. <laughs> okay, now we'll declare the public hearing closed. And um, Council Lady, can I start with you? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I would pick up on, on what uh, Councilmember Pulley said with regard to quote the larger area and how that might be chosen to to look. I mean, to me, the logic of saying Hilldale is a dividing line between a, a character defining area, and that to choose a larger area should be the, should be the area that this lot is in. Can can someone speak to, I mean, it seems to me like you can choose your larger area and, and support one argument or choose it another way and support another argument. So help me out there. So staff's analysis um, stopped in, at Hilldale um, because the regulations say that the surrounding parcels end at the block face. Um, so we do not cross streets in that analysis. Um, I'm sorry, the second half of your question had to do with? Just, yeah, just how you would choose, quote, the larger area. And, and what I'm hearing you say is you would stop at Hilldale and choose ones that are you know, on the That's same how side. The, the surrounding parcels are defined, is that the block face is, the end of the block face is generally a stopping point. Mm -hmm. um, so we use that as a marker in every comparability analysis. Um, and we used it here and looked at all of the components, not just size, but frontage, um, setback, orientation, um, in, in trying to arrive at our recommendation. And so what you did on the, on the back lot, which because Hilldale stops and there is nothing else, then you, you went to the harmonious development criteria Right, that last provision of that section, which um, does allow the Planning Commission to consider um, whether it's harmonious and, and that larger area. Um, but we, we felt based on the, um, you know, the full component of things we look at for compatibility, um, that splitting this and having the other, the second one oriented towards Hilldale was not consistent with the development pattern of this portion of the neighborhood. Thank you. That seems reasonable to me. I'll, I'll listen. Um, <clears throat> I'm struggling with this one. I started thinking something completely different, and by the end of it, I think I've changed my mind. I have no idea. But um, what's what I'm struggling with is that it's completely separate or different zoning than the one next to it. So there's single-family zoning, RS40, right next to it. And then this one that's like all by its, this, you know, lot is R10, and the only R10s are across the street from Wim Wimbledon. So I, <laughs> it's like it's on an island, so it seems to me like you could take that into account as well, or I am taking it into account. Um, if it was R is 40, I think I would lean more towards, you know, it should stay that way, it should stay one one lot, and it shouldn't be subdivided. But since it's not R is 40 and it's R10, um, I don't know. I think I'm just gonna keep listening to what everybody says. I'm really confused by this one. Commissioner Clifton. And we all start out pretty confused about any subdivision we look at because we see very few. Most of them are more technical and they're done by staff. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to compliment 
Mr. Holland for what I thought was an excellent analysis. Um, and, um, and he brought out some great mathematics, but the answer to it is the staff's answer of not crossing and of the general harmonious question, which is right in our regulations. We are allowed to do that. Um, I do, I'm actually a believer in urban neighborhoods um, being able to stand a little more density uh, when they're close to major streets. Uh, you know, I don't believe that as a, you know, inerrant rule, but as a general rule, I do believe we need to, to um, just sort of realize that density in urban neighborhoods along thoroughfares or very close to thoroughfares is just something we need to do. This is not where we are with this. Uh, I really do think the staff got the analysis right. I think they compared the right things, and I think their analysis of what would be harmonious under the, in the circumstances is correct, and I intend to support the staff recommendation. Thank you. Um, Chairman? Yeah, I've got a question to the staff. Um, Hilldale, uh, coming from the north, does that stop at Wimbledon? Does that actually go all the way down into the, um, the lot? It extends part of the way down, um, but it just deadens. And so the, the turnaround and the last bit of it would be constructed along lot two as part is of the, um, Is there a turnaround there now? Is that paved? It, it just ends I'm not there. talking about the proposed, but existing now. Is there's there's just a stub there now. There's just a stub there. There's no pavement or anything? No, it's paved, but it's, a, it's just a stub okay. How far portion of pavement. It comes down. This is paved right here, then. Correct. Okay. Just it comes south from Wimbledon, uh, across matches the lot to the west, and then ends uh, just beyond that lot. And that's when you okay. access these units. Well, actually, let me correct that. It actually, beyond the first lot, and then right at the drive yeah. that enters the, okay. the, the second, third. I see now. And I suppose one time it was proposed to go all the way down and connect to the south. Yeah, you know, the planner in me would love to see that road connected. I'm, not, I'm sure that there's some other people that would love to hang me for saying that out loud. Uh, but creating uh, that connectivity there would certainly have been something we would have wanted to do, but that's been abandoned. Um. The R-40 to the um, east stops at these lots. This is R-10 to the north. The lots are much smaller. To the northwest are much smaller. To the west, much smaller. And um, I think the lot one, you staff did have a comparability that met one of the lots further to the uh, east but then said it didn't have a comparability for the second one. But if we use the same comparability of that lot, both of these are much larger when they're subdivided than the lot further to the, uh, to the east. I listened to the other um, commissioners, but I uh, want to point out, I think the zoning, um, although, well, I'll just listen to the other commissioners and then come back. Commissioner Haynes. I'm going to support staff's recommendation. Okay. Commissioner Hagendare. Can we go to the slide? Um, I think it may have been in the applicant's presentation with the colored the green and the blue and the, the, the bigger picture. That's great. And that's back to our former chair, chair's uh, point. I mean, if you look, I do see a difference and I, I, in, in line with the with the staff's recommendation, I mean, they had to stop at the block face, and we can look at the bigger picture as a commission, correct, according to the regulations. But if you look at it realistically, I mean, Hilldale, I think it's Hilldale. Yeah, Hilldale is, from Hilldale E, is that east? East, it is different. That's a character difference. You know, west of Hilldale is smaller lots, different. And, and by this is one of those corner lots that, yeah, it could go either way, but then you inf go into encroaching into that 
then that, that subdivided, then what do we do from here? Well, the next lot is compared to that one, and we go down the line. So I'm going to, based on what I've seen and, and, and based on the analysis staff has done, it's not an easy one, but um, I'm going to support the staff's recommendation at this point. Commissioner Tibbs. Yeah, too. Um, that was a good analysis that Jennifer just did. That I, I feel like just with the community and trying to keep the character, um, at first I was kind of seeing that the, the smaller lots on the other side, but just based on the analysis that staff has done and trying to keep the harmonious character, uh, my feeling is to support uh, staff recommendation. Any Commissioner Haynes? Move approval of staff's recommendation. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you. Motion carries. So we are now on to items 12A, B, and C. 12A or A, B, and C? Uh, just A for right now. 12A. And is the person um, who was asking to speak in opposition to 12A still here? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Chairman, we actually have, it's A, B, and C. A, B, and C, okay. Oh, shoot. It's the Sean show. Yes. It is. <laughs> so I will be presenting items 12A, B, and C as they are associated cases. And we'll begin with item 12A. Um, this is a request. If I could ask everybody to leave quietly so we can move on to the next item. Thank you. This is a request for a specific plan on property located at 621A Hill Road to permit 31 units of residential. Um, this is adjacent to the Granbury Elementary School um, and the property is outlined in red. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The property is currently zoned R40 and it is when the, within a planned unit development overlay. The R40 zoning um, is for one and two family residential and requires a minimum of a 40,000 square foot lot size. Um, the overlaying PUD um, is the Hearthstone residential PUD and this is the, the last piece of that PUD that has not been developed, but this plan, um, the PUD plan calls for 13 residential lots in this area. The policy for this property is um, conservation uh, along the western border and then T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance, which is intended to preserve the general character of developed <laughs> suburban neighborhoods. Uh, staff finds that the size and density of the lots in this SP is consistent with the development pattern and preserves the character of the neighborhood and the context of a historic home on the property. This is the site plan proposed. It is for 31 lots. That includes a large lot um, with an existing historic home on it. There is also um, a larger lot, an open space lot that contains a historic cemetery. Um, there is pedestrian access provided um, so that that open space could serve as an amenity for the community. Uh, there will be a six foot sidewalk and a six foot planting strip along Hill Road. <coughs> Um, I would note that the lots are located along a single access drive and as part of this um, approval, the Planning Commission would be approving a variance to the length of the cul-de-sac per the subdivision regulations. Um, a factor in our recommendation of approval here was that we feel that this plan um, preserves and enhances the historic context of the home and the cemetery um, on the site. This proposal supports two critical planning goals by allowing for infill development on a lot with existing infrastructure. Um, it also preserves historic resources by placing a national register eligible home and cemetery on large lots that preserve the historic context. Um, as an associated case, the applicant is also seeking a historic landmark overlay district, um, which would further protect those two resources. So staff's recommendation on the SP is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Moving on to item 12B, this is the associated PUD cancellation. And it is a request to cancel a portion of the Hearthstone residential PUD on this 26.6 acre property. Staff's recommendation is to approve subject to approval of the associated zone change and disapprove if the associated zone change is not approved. 
Again, the base zoning is R40, which is intended for single family dwellings and duplexes. The PUD would have allowed 13 lots in this area. Again, the policy is suburban neighborhood maintenance intended to preserve the general character of suburban neighborhoods. The associated SP proposes lot sizes and density consistent with the surrounding character um, and better pedestrian connections and context for the historic home. So again, uh, staff's recommendation, because we find that the SP is consistent with policy, would be to approve cancellation of this portion of the PUD if the SP is approved and to disapprove if the associated zone change is not approved. And then finally, um, item 12C, which is a request for a historic landmark overlay district on a portion of this property. Um, this landmark district would be applied to about 10 acres. And um, when you put the SP plan underneath this, this is the large lots that contain the historic home and the cemetery. The portion of the property that would be subject to this historic overlay is outlined in red. Recommendation is to approve subject to approval of the associated zone change and PUD cancellation or disapprove if those are not approved. And the zoning, which we've been over, I'll breeze through. Same for the policy. Um, the Metro Historic Zoning Commission did recommend approval of the historic landmark on January 18th. Um, I would note that if the associated zone change and PUD cancellation are not approved, this landmark would conflict with the existing PUD plan, and so that's the reason for our recommendation of approval only if the other cases are approved. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we'll open up the public hearing and the applicant will have 10 minutes. You can state your name and address. And Good evening, uh, <coughs> Chairman, Commissioners, Council Member Allen, Allen Thompson with Reagan Smith and Associates, 315 Woodland Street, here on behalf of our client, Turnberry Homes. Uh, we have uh, originally submitted this SP application in December. We've worked very diligently with the staff uh, with Nashville Historic, Councilman Swope, and the community. Uh, we've had two community meetings, the most recent one this last Monday, uh, with, with strong support for this application that you see before you tonight. We'd very much uh, appreciate a recommendation for approval, and uh, we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any, you're gonna hold your two minutes for rebuttal? Yes, please. Okay, okay. Um, council member, uh, councilman, do you want to speak now or do you want to, speak you want to speak last? Okay. Um, is there anybody here uh, speaking in favor of the project? Anybody here speaking in opposition? <laughs> if you guys can come up and, and line up, you'll have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Sharon Shaw McEwen, 5712 Spring House Way. Uh, my lot is the one right behind uh, number 19, the new number 19. Um, I, I do wanna say how much I appreciate uh, you for all that you do and the councilman and uh, Turnberry for having the community meetings. I am in support of the project with conditions and I think my with conditions is different than what you mean when you say with conditions. So because I'm not always trusting uh, as in this political season of what people say, I wanted to be very public about what those uh, conditions for, for my support are. When it rained, not only in 2010, but four other times, there's a culvert that runs in between the new proposed development and our home on Spring House West. And that culvert is like a mighty river when it rains. We have had our home flooded uh, four times. We could not be reassured that that would be dealt with. Um, we, we were told, our councilman said, water, uh, 
the, the water department won't let anything happen that shouldn't happen. However, uh, I, I know that has not always been true in our city. So uh, what I'd like to be sure of is that one, that is given special attention to because my neighbors and I have had flooding um, and some of our insurances were even canceled uh, because of that. And secondly, um, that the buffer that I was told would be put between my property would become a part of the record. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeannie Gosky. I live at 513 Woodhurst Drive, which is just uh, in this representation uh, in the right corner of uh, this property on the other side of the Granberry School. And just want to say thank you uh, to all the commission members for hearing this. Thank you to Turnberry and to uh, Councilman Swope for the community meetings. Uh, I moved into the area with my husband and my family 12 years ago, along with another family. Uh, we moved intentionally together into this uh, part of the world and since then have made fast friends with several people in this neighborhood. It is a tight-knit community and what I appreciate about the community meetings is that it has uh, created a great conversation within our community about what do we really value about living together in a close-knit way like we do. Uh, one of the things that drew us to the neighborhood was the Granberry School, elementary school, and it is a hub of activity for this particular part of the world. As you know, it is the property that's directly adjacent to this development. And uh, we have a number, hundreds of children uh, that go to school there, and uh, a lot of the families of those children live in the vicinity of this development. Uh, at the community meetings and in the conversations that have circulated around those community meetings, there have been uh, some key concerns, and uh, I appreciate the effort that uh, Turnberry has given to some of these concerns, but I think overall um, the concerns need some more development, uh, including uh, the type of housing that's being arranged here compared to the two-mile radius values of real estate. Uh, it feels like they're out of balance, and I heard a lot about that, and I represent that with my comments my comments tonight. Also, there's a park proposed, and you heard about that. Um, it is a, a, a green space adjacent to the historical part of this property, but uh, that is something that needs to be looked at. And finally, the traffic is the most important thing to look at here, and the safety of the children that go to Granberry. Uh, they have not done the uh, thank, traffic thank studies you. that they need to in order to legitimize this project. Okay. Thank, thank you, very you so much. much. Hi again. Hello again. Robert Swope in the lovely District 4 area. Um, I want to thank the planning staff for recommending approval on this. Thank you. <laughs> and isn't it nice to have something with, with approval written beside it for a change? Yeah. It is for me. Um, Turnberry, Reagan Smith uh, approached me, I don't know, nine months ago with Mr. Cornelius, the landowner. Um, the Cornel Mr. Cornelius and his two sisters are the last remaining Grand Barrieres. They originally, this whole farm took up all of where Seven Springs sets, all of Hearthstone, all of Grand Barry Elementary, basically a thousand acres. Uh, and it has slowly but surely been chunked off. This is the last remaining property of the Grand Barrieres. Uh, it was very important to me and Mr. Cornelius both that the historic home be saved. It was also very important that the cemetery remain on property. So when Turnberry came into the picture, there were certain restrictions given the price of this land. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece of land. Given the price of this land, there were some huge issues on how to save the historic home, how to save the cemetery, and still let Turnberry make a profit in, in developing this area. I think they've done a great job. Um, I know planning staff has seen three or four different versions of this over the course of the last six months. We've had at least two community meetings and a lot of other private meetings, specifically with the Cornelius heirs, or Mr. Cornelius and the Granberry heirs, to make sure that all of what I just said was taken care of. Hence the reason for the historical overlay over top of the house and the green space. Um, 
it was originally started out that we were going to do one just over the cemetery and the house, and it didn't make any sense. So Turnberry came back with a different plan that did make sense and allow us to basically take almost half the land and put it under non-usable situations, keep it green space, that will be maintained and owned by the HOA, but is obviously, you know, you've got the neighbors right there on Trialsdale that already use that land for their own personal enjoyment, and there's no reason why that won't continue. Um, there's one public access. In the last community meeting, there was a split public access that went over to Granbury Park, which was donated by Mr. Cornelius. Uh, that has since forth been removed, and I think that update has made it to this plan. plan is updated, I believe we have a revised condition for the commission to consider. Okay. Um, the only reason being is there's a, there's a, a chain link fence to protect the children. And right now that public access ends in a chain link fence. And it was also a concern of some of the constituents around that area and the neighbors, and a very valid one actually, that that gave access to the back of an elementary school. So it's going away. Um, in reference to lot 19, you have my word publicly yeah. that when this hits council, I will do an amendment that lot 19 now gets a 30-foot buffer around it. And I think planning's already been made aware of this, and uh, Turnberry has no problem with it. We're going to increase the buffer on lot, lot 19 so that some of your watershed issues can be handled. And Turnberry has already dealt with stormwater quite a bit. Rankin Smith, you guys are, well your neighbors, I think. Um, yes, water runoff is a huge issue for everybody. It will be dealt with. Uh, with that said, I ask that you approve this as it's been presented to you. Thanks. Thank you. Did you have a comment? Uh, do you guys want your two minutes for rebuttal? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'll just speak to the, the topics that were brought up. Uh, we will obviously have to meet stormwater regulations, both from water quality and quantity standpoint. Uh, before we move forward with any type of construction. Uh, we'll also have to meet the requirements of Public Works, and we've worked with them uh, from an access study for our entrance. Uh, we'll be making improvements along Hill Road, which is our frontage, about 450 feet. Right now you have a sidewalk immediately on the curb. We're going to have to pull that off, put a six-foot green space and a six-foot sidewalk, uh, improving pedestrian circulation along that frontage, which is one of the traveled routes to Granberry School. Um, and that's, that's where we are, and we're happy to answer any other questions. Thanks. Thank you. you. Yes, yeah, so if I can get the commissioners to look at the staff's recommendation, the conditions, um, and in condition one, uh, to the councilman's point, uh, that condition needs to be amended for y'all's consideration. And the second sentence that reads, the connection uh, in the easement between lots five and six shall be paved sidewalk and a, and a trail, a minimum of five feet of width, and shall extend to the proposed sidewalk along the internal access road to the eastern property line. That should be struck. Uh, from that condition because as uh, the councilman pointed out that this is school property and this is the the playground area back here's the back of the school and there is a chain link fence that runs the length of the, that western border uh, along the school and it isn't a good idea uh, to have a small access point in the back of uh, elementary school and so we're going to encourage the chain links fence stay there and that there not be a uh, that easement at that location. So that is one amendment to the conditions that you have in front of you. Thank you. Okay, public hearing is closed and um, I will go ahead and start, mix it up, Commissioner Haynes. No comments. All right, Commissioner Hagendeer. I have no comments except to ask how much the lots are gonna cost. No. <laughs> No, I'm joking. Uh, no, I, I, I see the development pattern around here, unlike the last one we just heard. And I will strike that from the record. It was a joke. No. Um, unlike the other ones we've reviewed, I mean, clearly this falls in line with the development in the area and makes a lot of sense. So, Commissioner Tibbs? Yeah, it, uh, I agree with staff recommendation. It does follow the, this area a lot as opposed to the last one. And of course, I appreciate the um, overlay that was already approved and the um, 
the green space, so I, I plan to support staff recommendation. Thanks. Okay, Council Lady. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the community meetings that have happened and the uh, uh, concerns have either been addressed or being addressed, and I can say that I will be working with Council Member Swope to make sure that 30-foot buffer is there. So um, it's, it's, it looks like a good project and the, the homework has been done, so I support. Well, can I ask one question? <laughs> um, relative to the to the um, neighbor's comment about stormwater, just when I, I don't see, I just see stormwater approved, so I don't see any stormwater conditions, and I'm just wondering if, how that's been handled, or. At this point in time, uh, this is a preliminary plan, so I'm not sure what the concept is exactly. I haven't seen this one. Um, do you guys, did you do buyer retention or do you know if you actually selected? Normally at this point we get like concept level, here's space, we'll do stormwater here, this is the low point. So we're not sure of the exact design at this point because it's just concept. Okay. So. Okay, so the fact that there are not specific conditions in here does right. not mean that various improvements won't be made to address exactly. the concerns. Yes, they'll be required. Yeah. They'll be required to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my goodness. Since you didn't call on, can I make the motion? You can make the motion. <laughs> I tried to get creative, and it didn't work. Yeah. Well, I think the stormwater issue that the lady raised on 19 certainly needs to be addressed because water just it needs to be corrected and I think that everybody's on board to do that and there'll be a traffic impact study made you know for the final so uh, as, you know as to what probably already been made for the sidewalks and traffic for the kids or safety of the kids so based on that I'm going to make a record a, a um, motion motion <laughs> never could think of that word <laughs> <laughs> Make a motion to approve the staff recommendations. Okay. With, with the exception of that's on 12A. Oh, yeah, no, we got to vote on 12A, and then we also and, need to uh, make the amendment. That is deleting item uh, one on the conditions. Uh, uh, so, wait, hold uh, on. You mean uh, yeah, amending uh, condition one to delete that portion that I read into the record? This, okay. The second sentence. <laughs> second. Okay, so all in favor of 12A? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next one is item 12B. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve with staff recommendations. All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. And 12C, finally, motion to approve with staff recommendations. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, right. Okay. Motions carry. Item 24. They were winning a minute ago. Well, you want to order a pizza? <laughs> oh, man. Hard for the course. Stupid Duke pulled ahead. 3940. High score in first half. <laughs> Okay, the next item um, is item 24. I'm sorry, could you state your name? <laughs> Sean Shepard with the planning department. <laughs> You've seen a little bit of me tonight. Um, item 24 is a request to change the zoning on various properties located on Clearview Drive, Crescent Road, Estes Road, Westmont Avenue, and Woodmont Circle from R10 to RS10. The subject properties are highlighted in yellow. And staff's recommendation is to approve the second substitute ordinance. The current zoning on the properties is R10, which is intended for single family dwellings and duplexes with a minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet. The requested zoning RS10 um, is for single family dwellings only, but the same minimum lot size. The policy for the area um, is T3 Suburban Neighborhood Maintenance, which is intended to preserve and enhance the general character of established suburban neighborhoods. There is some conservation policy and open space policy on a park property in the area. The area currently contains a mix of one and two family residential uses. 
some background. You considered a version of this proposal um, on January 12th. That um, proposal had 15 more parcels in it um, than the one you're reviewing tonight, or seven more than were in staff's recommendation last time. So there have been seven additional um, proposed to be excluded from the zone change this time. Um, on February 7th, the council member in introduced the second substitute that you're considering tonight at second reading, um, and then re-referred it to you for consideration this evening. So this is the second substitute ordinance. Um, the parcels included are shaded in gray. Both Nashville Next and the community plan specific to this area call for a diversity of housing choices, and the neighborhood has a mixed pattern of one and two family development. The proposal excludes parcels with known legal duplexes and additional properties in the vicinity of those known duplexes. These would retain the current R10 zoning. Leaving these parcels in R10 would help to maintain the existing housing diversity, which is consistent with the goals of the policy. We have received a number of questions about how we identified those known legal duplexes. Um, the codes department typically would make those determinations, usually at the request of an owner who would provide them with a fair amount of information. Um, but we used the information that was available to us, which included um, the land use map, which is based on information from the tax assessor, um, updated about twice a year. Also, the tax assessor classifications um, and permit records that were available to us through the Metro um, permitting database. Uh, none of these pieces tells the whole story. We looked at them in conjunction, um, and that was the, the basis for identifying the known legal duplexes. So staff finds the proposal is consistent with the policy and that the excluded parcels provide opportunity to maintain the existing diversity of one and two family housing. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the second substitute. Thank you. Council lady. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for, for putting up with me again. Um, I'm Councilwoman Kathleen Murphy, um, 231 Orlando Avenue, District 24, and we are um, back with um, a new map that I think reflects some more of the community input and existing duplex situation and things like that, which I will address again in a minute. Um, I first wanted to kind of point out what was interesting um, with Councilman Pulley, who was here earlier and, and had a case that is just kind of right down the street from here. And I think a lot of the concerns that you heard from his neighbors are the reason why we we brought this, this rezoning before you in the first place is um, the density and increase of density in places that don't match the existing character. And so today I'm going to ask you again to kind of look beyond just the shaded area on these streets. You know, I was here last fall um, and did the, the RS-15 and the RS-20 up to the top. And, and keep in mind that this is kind of internal streets to the, the broader neighborhood here that is largely um, zoned single family. Um, those recently and, and the streets um, I guess to your to your right, um, my right at least, um, our single family as well. So uh, how did we get here? Again, this started in August with um, a property that was torn down and was going through, we, uh, the neighborhood and I brought a case to the BZA. Um, at, in August, uh, the neighbors started to discuss with me down zoning this area. I held off on down zoning Estes Crescent and Clearview until I could have some more community meetings, but because the, the bulk of the residents at those meetings were on Woodlawn, so that's why I went ahead and filed Woodlawn um, and did not file these streets at that time. Um, October 16th, I had a community meeting, which I notified um, through my email list and was also put out on the neighborhood listservs and next door and things like that. And it does, it, at that time we discussed these streets and Kenner and more of Woodmont Circle. And Kenner and Woodmont Circle are still figuring out if they would like an overlay or a down zone and some other options. And so we've left them out of this map until we hear more input from them. Um, that community meeting, there was also a neighbor who sent, who passed out flyers, I know along the Estes um, Street as well. And actually I had people 
council and Councilman Pulley's district asked to be opted into this, and I was like, you're gonna have to take that up with him. So my, uh, my November newsletter, um, again, that I put out via my newsletter list and is sent out on the next door and the, the neighborhood list serve, discussed this uh, rezoning and added a survey. Uh, my December newsletter also put out the, the discussed streets and the survey and announced a community meeting that I held on December 14th. Uh, for that community meeting on December 14th, I um, sent the emails and, and the uh, Metro Council office mailed postcards to the properties and the surrounding, the, the same that we do for the, um, the, the zoning letters. I forget how many yards or feet that is so and then also in january my january newsletter recapped the meeting had the map and the survey um, and then we were before y'all and so then my february meeting uh, my february newsletter again had an update of all of these things. So going into the last planning meeting when I was here last, um, the responses, I took the responses that y'all had received before that meeting, um, the ones that I had received through my um, my list, um, my survey, and then people who spoke here that night, and it calculated down to, of the property owners, not, I took out the people who were outside the property, although, uh, I mean, outside of the shaded areas, although as you can see and you hear, even though they don't live maybe on these streets or have the property on the street, what happens here is going to affect them. But when I just took the shaded area, um, the support was at 71%. I have emailed um, out this new map, and I know the letters had been sent, but I've emailed out this new map to the people who had spoken and had emailed me. Um, so I don't have like an updated number, but again, prior going into the last meeting, the support was at 71% of, of the property owners in this area, um, give or take one or two points in case my math is wrong. Um, so I would assume those numbers have not changed much. I've gotten one or two more in support, one or two more that might be interested in taking out. And while when this was filed and the amendment was filed, I have heard from um, a property owner here tonight and, and one or two others in email that I said, you know, once we get, I can't amend this before we get here, but we can amend you out afterwards. So um, I took those numbers, I drew a map. Um, I think the staff appreciated my color coordinated map and things like that, or at least I hope you did and you lied to me. Um, and so I asked them to come up with a map that reflected the community input of the letters that you received, um, the people who spoke here last time, and this is what they came up with. And I know that they have spoken, you, um, Sean spoke a little bit about the, the duplex issue. And Brandon, who I know we stole from y'all, um, and I really spent some time going through and um, Katie Varney, who could not be here tonight, actually walked and mapped out in six different categories the types of homes in this area. So, I mean, we really had some boots on the ground figuring out where things are. And I think that the staff came down on the right side to say, if you are not a permitted duplex, if we don't know 100% that you are still acting as a duplex, that we would, that they considered them as um, you know, in the in the rezone here, unless we heard otherwise from the from the property owners, I, I think that's fair. I mean, we can really only go off of what the history of the permit and the and the duplexes of that. And and again, if some of these, I know that there are a few homes here that have two mailboxes and might have two addresses, um, and they can still go to to codes and and use their existing rights um, as grandfathered in. Um, in that way, and so I feel I feel comfortable with the fact that there may be one or two duplexes here that are not legally permitted, but they still have the option to to exercise their their rights in that way. Um, I know that y'all don't want me to read from Nashville Next, but I just wanted to touch on the fact that this is a neighborhood maintenance policy. This is not a neighborhood maintenance infill area. This is not a neighborhood evolving. Um, and at the rate that some of these townhomes have come down in the recent probably four or five months and tall skinnies have gone up, it, it looks much more like an evolving area. And that's not what the neighbors have, the, the majority of the neighbors have expressed to me that's not what they want. They want to keep the existing character of the neighborhood. Neighborhood. And so that's what we are asking y'all to do is to really help us with that. These are interior streets. They're not on West End. Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, surrounded by single family lots and on other streets that's important to keep in mind. So um, 
Approving the zone change is simply an expansion of the existing neighbor, neighboring single family zoning, which I think is consistent with the policy and the plans of this area and consistent with the neighborhood input that I have received. Um, it's appropriate given the infrastructure in the area and can be served well by that infrastructure. Uh, it allows for the existing character to remain and be preserved while still providing for the variety and density. This area is um, in the broader sense and just on these streets characterized by a little pocket of density with single family in between them. And this, this zone change is going to continue that pattern of development. Um, so again, I think that if there are questions, staff can kind of probably elo more eloquently explain the policy decisions behind some of these lots that are in, some that are out. Um, but, but ultimately, um, I think that they, ref I think this map really does reflect the input that we've received from the community before last planning and, um, and now. And so I ask you to, uh, to let us move forward with this and um, and then hopefully we take a break from zoning for a little bit. So um, thank you and I'll save, save some time. So thanks. Thank you and thank you for bringing this back to us for another discussion. Um, so I guess let's go ahead and let everybody here speaking in favor of this legislation line up. And please come to the mic. You'll have two minutes. Please state your name and address. Great, thanks. I'm Jarrett Bell, 209 Woodmont Circle, and I'm president of the Kenner Manor Neighborhood Association. We are approximately 170 homes uh, as part of our association, and about half of the homes that are up here uh, as part of this ordinance are in our association. We recently uh, were listed on the National Register, and we're pretty excited about that. We love our neighborhood the way that it is, and um, I'd say this is kind of the first phase of what we're doing to try to keep the neighborhood the way that it is, whether it's the down zoning or a contextual overlay um, and some other parts. So with that being said, uh, our, vote, our board did vote unanimously in favor of this ordinance, and I'm happy to support it tonight. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I will just ask that we, we try not to repeat too much as we go through the list. Hi there, my name is Natalie Clements. I'm at 710 Clearview Drive. Thank you so much for being here so late. Um, my husband, George, our three young kids and I have um, three taxable lots. Um, our home has been designated in the National um, and Tennessee Registers of Historic Places by the National Park Service and the U.S. Department of Interior. We were really pretty proud of that. Two of our three lots are undeveloped. They are beautiful green earth with several hardwood trees that are over 100 years old. Um, our home has been in the Clements family for over 70 years, having been paid by two Clements brothers in 1946. Um, we favor the rezoning from R10 to RS10 um, zoning. It is not in our best financial interest to request the zoning change. However, we are looking beyond our immediate financial interest to the interest of the greater good of our neighborhood and of our neighbors. Our home is a brief eight minute walk to um, the Woodmont Park on Estes Avenue and we'd like to continue to see our children be able to ride bikes and walk there. Um, uh, expanding high density into a sur suburb around town, which Nashville is consistently rated as one of the least walkable markets in the country, will create larger issues relating to congestion, pollution, and the basic quality of life for years to come. Um, we hope that you support RS10 rezoning. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Catherine Cunningham. I live at 902 Clearview Drive. Um, I've lived in this home for eight years. Um, my husband and I brought this home because Clearview was a quiet street where we could raise our family. We have three children. They're eight years old, five years old, and four years old. They ride their bikes on the street, they walk on the street. And I wrote an entire speech while I've been sitting here and I'm not gonna waste everyone's time saying it, but um, I just wanna repeat that this, um, as neighbors, is what we have been asking for. We are tired of fighting lot by lot development that doesn't fit in with our neighborhood. Um, and I know that one of the um, commissioners said that Urban neighborhoods can stand a little more density, and when it's your five-year-old on a bike, they just can't. So, um, 
Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Adrienne Claggett. I live at 711 Estes Road for the past 15 years. My house is 1,600 square feet, single family dwelling, built in 1950s, and it's on a quarter acre of land. So I am well aware in today's Nashville market, this land is more than my dwelling. So I'm a teardown. I am in support of this rezoning that is proposed by Councilman Murphy. And this is why. Back in May 2015, I was leaving for work and in the yard at 712 across the street from me of Estes, there was a sold realtor sign. And I thought to myself, well, that was quick. When was that open house? Missed that. And when I came home, there was another realtor sign in the yard for 714 Estes. Well, that triggered me to think, oh, here we go. The tear down, build up fever, written up in the Nashville scene and that I had witnessed in East Nashville in the Belmont Lips <laughs> Lipscomb areas are getting their start on Estes. So the 714 property, which FYI, is 2,160 square feet, did have an open house and subsequently was sold to a couple who intended to live on the property, and they still do. Meanwhile, the 712 dwelling was torn down. Myself and other neighbors were not surprised. It was time. And subsequently, a 4,977 square foot single family home was built there and sold to a family. Both of these dwellings are on a 0 0.48 acres of land. So now we jump to April 4th, 2016. A for sale sign goes up in the yard of 607 Estes Road. Now that was a two bedroom, one bath dwelling on a half acre land. And that's where our skinny is. Please change the zoning. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Holshauser. I live at 720 Estes Road and have been there for 17 years. I'm not opposed to remodeling or construction work, but I am concerned about the density in our neighborhood. How, more houses mean more traffic. The main problem I'm going to, ish, to go, because I have a feeling a lot of people are going to say the other things that I wanted to, <clears throat> but the main problem I have is that these new structures are large with most likely three and four bedrooms and multiple vehicles. Unlike townhouses, where they may be allotted two car spaces, parking spaces per unit, these will have no allocation. Then you have an additional family members or guests coming to visit, and they're going to be competing for the limited parking spaces that are there. So the question is, do we use the, the I don't, don't think you call it an easement, but the setback for parking in front of the houses? Because if you do, in front of those houses, you're going to have a constant constant look of parking spaces, a <coughs> parking lot. So then if we don't park there, we park on the street. We well, are not supposed to. And I live on Estes, so there's not any room on Estes. If you do park on the street, you're parking in the bike lot or the bike lane. So I am totally against having this large number of skinny houses going up and ruining our neighborhood. This is the reason we bought the house we're in is because of the beauty that we have and it's slowly being destroyed. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Janet Garbanola, 715 Estes Road. I'm just here to support the change. Hello, I'm Carlette Forbes. Please excuse my scratchy throat. My husband and I have lived at 3912 <coughs> Woodmont Boulevard for approximately 25 years. We are directly on the northeast corner of Woodmont Estes, an already very busy neighborhood intersection. Our home was built around 1930, as is many of the homes around us. We have loved this old neighborhood, filled with lovely old homes, gigantic trees, lush lawns, and our beloved community park. These are the things that make our community special. These are the things that make Nashville special. It has been mentioned that people have the right to exploit their property value, but it should not be at the expense of neighbors and neighborhood. 
We have certainly had the opportunity to exploit our property with the numerous offers over the past 25 years to buy our backyard. We appreciate Councilman woman Kathleen Murphy and her tireless efforts to maintain the integrity of our neighborhood. She needs your help. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Bob Covington. I live at 907 Estes Road and have since 1965. Your website, I discovered today, proclaims that neighborhoods are the Backbone of Nashville. We're here asking you not to break our back. <laughs> our neighborhood developed largely in the 1930s, and you know what things were like then. That was not a time for building mansions. Our lots ranged from a quarter to a half acre, occasionally a tiny bit more. But they're not huge lots. We have a, a variety of styles, a variety of levels of grandeur, if you would. A lot of differences in square footage, but we are by and large a single family, owner-occupied neighborhood. And we are a neighborhood. We came together as one when Woodmont School was sold and became Woodmont Park. You have no idea how we lobbied for that. And we still do fundraisers and have work days. All too soon, my executor will be selling that place at 907 Estes. I want her to sell it to a millennial who will love those three maple trees and do a better job of trimming the hedge. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Susanna Scott Barnes. I live at 700 Crescent Road, and my husband and I own two parcels in this down zone area. Since 2004, we've poured our heart and soul into this house in our bank account. Um, we're the third owners of a historic home built in 1922. We did a renovation when we bought it, and we did another one last year. We've invested substantially in this house, in the property, the yard, the patio, the landscaping, and our vegetable garden. So you can imagine how disappointed we were when we found out that our neighbors at 601 Estes had sold their single family home to developers. And just before the property was sold, it was subdivided into two parcels. What was contextual house of 2,900 square feet in keeping with the neighborhood can be, and now will be, four homes. This is on 0.48 acres. I, I thought maybe some neighbors and I could buy out the developers, and when we approached them, they said they would need over $2 million, $2.07 million. So how are they able to make that kind of money? By pulling down every tree, which has already happened, building the tallest, skinniest houses that codes will allow. Their property sits uphill from ours. Where will their stormwater go? When every inch of their lot's been built on, it'll either run into the water system that's overcompromised anyway, or on our lawn. There's been a lot of talk about property rights, particularly when it comes to development rights. I wanna make a case for my rights to maintain the value of our property. Our neighbors are diminishing the property of our, our, our value property, property value. When we sell, we, no one wants to sit next to four tall skinnies. I'm just one of many who have similar stories to tell about this in our neighborhood. 704 Crescent and 607 Estes have recently been um, converted to tall skinnies. If every house can and will go from one house to two or four, it, it's bad for our neighborhood. Please help us maintain our character of our neighborhood. Thank you. My name is Willows and I live at um, 700 Crescent Road. My brother and sister and my brother and sister and I like to ride our bikes around the neighborhood, and we also like to walk our dog. If more houses get built, I don't think it will be very self for, safe for us to do that. Please support this. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Bobby Towns. I live at 3939 Woodlawn Drive. 
and that is the lot, the property is located at the north end of Estes Road. And uh, my lot has two entrances, there's one from Woodlawn and the other one is from Estes. And the property that the lady just spoke about, 601, that backs up to my property. I do not object to building new homes that complement the neighborhood. However, I do object to, which I feel like is an intrusion to the integrity of our neighborhood. These tall and skinnies, they're out for people just to make a buck on. I resent that. So I hope that you will support the downzoning. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> My name is Lynette Towns, and I live at 3939 Brush Hill Road. Uh, not Brush Hill Road. I live <laughs> lived there for many years, but I live at Woodlawn Drive. I'm sorry. <laughs> I say that frequently. Um, I want to just agree with everyone who has already spoken uh, that I certainly agree with the downsizing in our neighborhood, and we appreciate all that Council Lady Kathleen has done to support us and, and John Cooper as well. And we want to thank you and hope that your support will help us maintain the integrity of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Chin. I live at 802 Crescent Road. Um, I have two boys, ages four and six. Uh, who also, as others have said, love to ride their bikes and walk to the park and sled when there's snow. Um, I think the thing about this neighborhood is that it is adorable as it is. And so it's scary when you see um, houses go in and that are just crammed onto a lot. And it's happening a little bit. And in that neighborhood, it just doesn't fit. Um, and it's not why many of us that are standing up here moved to that neighborhood in the first place. So thank you. Um, I am in favor of the rezoning. Thank you. My name is Paul Clements. I now live in Williamson County, but I grew up on Clearview Drive and um, have an unnatural attached to, attachment to that place. I coached kids sports for 40 years there. Uh, I'm a neighborhood historian, and I thought it'd be good to have a little change of pace, a little history for you. Um, until the mid-1980s, the Planning Commission was a sort of a, a traditional, had a traditional neighborhood perspective. And when Nashville had its boom period in the mid-80s, that all got changed. And the days of Irving Hand and Ferris Deep were basically taken away when Bob Pasley did not get the, the job. And, it, and the Planning Commission went in an entirely different direction. This particular overlay here, the, the R10, was an aberration, uh, I think, by following the staff's um, recommendation, it'll be putting things back the way they were. This is a normal thing between, you know, they're, they're, they're folks who see neighborhoods as places to live, and they're p folks who see, see them as profit centers, and then people in between who, you know, think that well, I, I want to be able to sell my property for more. So there's a conflict. I hope right now it's a polite conflict between folks who see, see it monetarily and folks who see it as a living environment. And that was all set in motion, and it shouldn't have ever happened because if things had been done the right way 30 years ago, then we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. But I, I'm loving the fact this is finally happening because I've watched the, the, the pendulum swung way, you know, crazily to one side, and I think this has a chance to put it back and have some balance in it. And I was all about kids and sustaining children's experiences in a, in a place and having a, a neighborhood be a living place for kids. So a bunch of tall skinnies, as I didn't, I didn't heard that until today, that certainly isn't what I want to see as an environment. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Bob Parker and my wife and I live at 711 Clearview Drive. And we're here tonight to support the efforts of our neighbors and our council lady and Councilman Cooper uh, in asking each of you to consider and to vote to support the staff's recommendation. You've heard so many good reasons from my neighbors who are very eloquent, I believe. One, of, one that maybe hasn't been mentioned is these kids that ride the bicycles on our street, Clearview, there are no sidewalks. It's a fairly narrow street. 
if a car happens to park on, partly on the pavement, two cars can't pass each other. They have to wait. So it becomes a one-lane street. More congestion, more people, more cars, cars, which I think come, goes along with different residential units, uh, is, is just a, something that, and it, that might not have been mentioned that really I think should be considered. Um, but I want to end by just saying thank you for giving your time <laughs> frequently for this long session and for the council lady who has spent I don't know how much time, but she's kept everybody posted and she's been very nice and very articulate about what she's trying to accomplish with her ordinance. And we ask that you consider and support the staff's recommendation. Thank Thanks. you. Hello, my name is Georgia Hobb. I've lived on Clearview 44 years. 36 years in 605 side of a duplex, eight years as the owner living in the 603 side. I'm one of those people that is in a two-family dwelling, what was originally thought of as a duplex. It was built to be owner lived in and with an apartment in the other side that was rented out. I've lived there and, and was very thankful to be there as a renter and now as the owner. I've seen the definition of duplex change in those 44 years, and I feel that my home was built in agreement with the homes in the neighborhood and is very similar to the homes that are there. We have trees, we have a driveway that is uh, not such that you have to back out on the road. The new houses that are built on a lot where there are two houses are extremely close together. Their access to the road is difficult. Parking is gonna be difficult for them. We noticed that as they were building some of the new ones. And please remember, we're on a circle. It's a lovely place to live, the way Clearview and Crescent come in together. And we do walk a lot there. But our street is narrow, as was said. It does not even have a line to indicate lanes. There is no shoulder, there is no curb, there is no sidewalk. I believe that we are saturated with the two, half, uh, two family dwellings. Thank you. Well, I'm Peggy Ross on uh, 907 Clearview Drive. I moved into that house in 1949. At that time, I was a little bitty girl, and it's so nice now to see, after we all grew up, all us kids who were in that neighborhood then, uh, all grew up, and some of us are still in the neighborhood, and now we see a whole new crop of little children, and I think you've just seen one of the outstanding children on that street. Um, we'd love to maintain the character of the street, so I hope that you will approve the proposal of our wonderful councilwoman, and thank you. Thank you. My name's Julie Delavante, and I live at 900 Clearview Drive, and my husband Mike is here tonight. And we have two boys, and as you've been hearing all night, bicycle riders running in the street. Um, and we love it that way. I also um, was drawn to this neighborhood because of all the trees and the green grass, and we don't want to see that being replaced by four houses. Um, there's some lots there that are threatened to have um, multiple tall and skinnies put up and two cars for each one. and Then that's eight new cars to ride around by our kids that are riding the bicycle. Um, uh, two days ago, uh, Mayor Megan Berry put out this, which you guys may have seen, the livable Nashville. And uh, in her letter, she was suggesting, how could we make Nashville be the greenest place that is in the Southeast? And there's a lot of uh, suggestions for that, and none of them really say tear down trees and build up all these tall and skinnies. And one of her suggestions was to plant new trees. So to take some of our lots and be able to allow somebody to put four houses where one should go is the opposite of that. And she has some um, specific, specific, excuse me, specific things. She says, encourage creation of new public open spaces. Specific actions could include, but not limited to, consider revising the zoning 
<clears throat> codes and uh, prioritize open space preservation, parks and greenways, and parts of residential and commercial areas. So in this residential area where we just really love riding our bikes and seeing the green grass, we just do not want to see a lot of new houses crammed into too much space with a driveway with four extra cars. So I support this. My name is Chris Modisher and I live at 1003 Clearview Drive. I'm also on the board of the Kenner Manor Neighborhood Association. Uh, you heard earlier that the association voted unanimously to support this. We are committed to the preservation of our neighborhood and this is a multi-step process. The first one was last year getting in historic, the National Historic Register for the entire neighborhood. This is the next step which really addresses density in the neighborhood. The next step would be uh, to address the issue of the tall skinnies through a conservation overlay or something which we're going to be discussing at our March 8th meeting, but I urge you to adopt this uh, recommendation uh, with regard to the zoning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else speaking in favor of this proposal? Okay, so let's have those that are speaking in opposition come up to the lineup. My name is Ellen Rodriguez. I live at 240 Innsworth Place, which backs up to Clearview, but I own a duplex at 707 Crescent Road. And I'm confused, which is why I'm here. <laughs> um, so this map that I have has the residential condos and the people who opted out. There are six, possibly seven, duplexes that are in the R10, RS10 zoning. I find that very confusing in the map to people who aren't looking at it, who don't, are not aware. My duplex was built in 1960, and it's in gray. Will it be zoned RS11 until, I mean RS10 until I prove that it's R10? Um, I think the map needs to be corrected to show where the potential duplexes are. If you count all the duplexes, there's also some zero lot lines. In that circle of Crescent and Clearview, there are 43 properties. There's the potential of half of those properties to be opted out. And I'm not quite sure um, how that affects the character the integrity or changes anything. Um, I'm, not, I'm not here for or against because I don't live there. I think it's important for the people who are actually living there um, to be the ones who decide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Nixon. Um, my wife and my, and my excuse me, <clears throat> my best friend and his wife own uh, 731 Crescent, which has been referred to as the Island Lot, I guess. Um, if I had known what I know tonight, uh, I would have been in the other line. Um, nice job, man. <laughs> um, what I'm a little confused about is, is and let me take it from uh, Council Lady uh, Murphy's own writing. She said, uh, I've held two community meetings about this zoning. Uh, flyers have been distributed, postcards, and two letters sent to property owners. It's also been in five of my newsletters and posted on neighborhood social media and listservs. I never got any. I never got the first one. I would have been at that meeting. These people would have known that my rights, my property rights, which I very much uh, adhere to, would have allowed us to build four units on uh, uh, 731 Crescent. I had no intention of building four units. I never asked to build four units. I came to the planning and, and asked how I could, could uh, build two. And uh, I have talked with you, uh, the people here, over the last two weeks, and I very much appreciate what you've said and how you've acted and 
how we'll go forward and those kinds of things. But uh, I am a property rights person. I would like to state that I am, and, and I do believe in that. Um, I have one little problem in the fact that when this passes, uh, which it, it assuredly will, um, the stretch of time between the time that my property is now R10 and it goes to RS10 is going to put me in default of my loan until I can get the property split, however long that takes, then I'm going to be in default. So I would like to start as fast as I could and would ask that you opt me out temporarily until I can split the lot, and I'll be glad to make it RS10. Glad to. Thank you so very much. Good evening. My name is Marshall Albritton. I live at 900 Estes Road. My wife and I bought that property in July of 1989, so we've lived there almost 28 years. It's n lot number 164 on Estes right before you get to Crescent as you head into town. I'm supportive of this uh, overlay or this change as it relates to Crescent and Clearview because that, that clearly has a neighborhood feel to it. But if you have driven down this stretch of Estes Road and you look at the homes on either side, I agree with Councilman uh, Clifton's uh, comments about this being a place where increased density would be a good thing. It would, uh, uh, we purchased this property knowing its current zoning. This stretch of Estes already has duplexes and it has lots now where homes, many of the homes are rented and you may have five or six college students in those homes with five or six cars that are stuck in the driveway. And if there's no development that is allowed here or the only development is hoping that the property might sell and somebody might build a McMansion on it, that's really gonna keep the, pro in my view, it's gonna keep this stretch of Estes from developing appropriately. So it's this one narrow stretch of Estes from about Crescent up to Woodlawn that I think would be appropriate. There's no one that rides bikes on that section unless you are a cyclist. There are no children riding bikes there because there are no sidewalks. Allowing development would actually increase the, the development of sidewalks, so we would actually have them. So that would be helpful. I don't think it would increase parking because again, you'd go to homeowners instead of renters. And uh, the problem is though that I do agree with the standards for the developments, there, there needs to be some uniformity so we don't end up with houses that are too close and too skinny, but we do need development and I'm concerned if we stop that, that for that stretch it would be negative. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in opposition? Um, thank you. Um, uh, John Cooper, Councilman, I guess nobody at the end of the meeting. I would like, um, it's easy to be grateful to people at 4 in the afternoon, and it's a lot more at 8.30 at night. And I just want to thank you all and everybody here. I would just urge you, um, I think Council Lady Murphy's done a magnificent job in a difficult situation. I would urge you to accept the staff report. R10 to RS10 seems an appropriate adjustment, a, a tweaking. There's a good mix of housing types already in this neighborhood. And the neighbors want to protect their home, their value as homes for their families as built, uh, and not be a platform for denser development and investment property. So don't push neighborhoods into being redevelopment zones when they have asked to stop. And I just, I think that's a, a great way to end this particular meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Council Lady, do you want to come? Yes, I will touch on a, a few um, a few items that was brought up, and and then kind of let the staff kind of cover some of the areas that are more technical than than I can imagine. Um, speaking to the the island property is something that I've spoken with the, the property owner a number of times over the past week or two, um, and it's gone back and forth on whether they're going, they want to subdivide, they don't. I believe that they've dropped off a, a, a plat to the planning um, staff, and I had previously said at the last meeting, and I've said it to the, the property owner since then, is that I'm happy to help them if there's a setback issue because they're subdividing and developing under RS10, I'm happy to help them with 
variances or whatnot, um, but that planning and I, when we work together, they, they recommend it staying in. Um, and, and so, and I, I even asked the property owner if he had started the subdivision um, process to today or yesterday whenever he dropped it off and and he didn't and I think part of part of our concern is part of my concern is is that if if we let them out um, even if it's promised for later what what does that mean um, and how does that affect the overall character um, of what could happen if, if something ha and they sell out or, or they don't end up developing that area secondly again I wanted to reiterate that yes there are some areas um, there are a few houses here that are the old school duplexes that have a smaller side and a larger side that you had a property owner um, and then you know a tenant and those again we extensively went back and forth and the staff thinks that I'm probably neurotic at how much I requested them to research these properties to try to see if they had permits because I said I, I even sit all over like a couple lists and we're like no you're wrong there's still more and and I mean they they double check this with codes to make sure that we were taking out the the ones that had the paperwork that we could prove legally were were those duplexes and that's how we got here um, again the suburban this is a suburban neighborhood maintenance policy and the policy says that they will experience change over time, primarily when new building when buildings are replaced or expanded, um, and when this occurs, efforts should be made to maintain, retain the existing character of the neighborhood in terms of the development pattern, building form, land use, and the public realm. And these lots, while they are 10,000, a little bit under, a little bit over, um, a few of them are 20,000 square feet. If they subdivide um, or develop. Two on two on all these lots. That's not going to match the existing character. Again, this is not an infill area in the policy. The policy is neighborhood suburban maintenance, um, and so I think it is appropriate for what the majority of the neighborhoods are asking. Neighbors are asking to save the neighborhood. So please approve this. Um, please don't make us come back like Councilman Pulley and and fight on a lot of properties in the future. I think again, the staff has done a great job putting up with me um, and incorporating the community input into this map and I think it will maintain the character and the charm that you've heard about tonight. Um, again, this is still allowing, this is not saying that we are against new development, we are just, uh, you know, concerned about the overdevelopment of this area. And so I'm happy to answer any questions um, and I hope that you will um, support the neighbors and I in moving forward with um, what I think you all asked for last time I was here, a map that more accurately reflected the situation and I think this map does that. Okay, um, let's go ahead and open up the debate at the end of the day. <laughs> council lady. Um, thank you, I have, to, I have to commend my fellow council member on, on the work she's done on this. Uh, I think she's done yeoman's duty to work really hard, it sounds like to me, to, to listen to concerns and to incorporate those in every way she can or to, to try to deal with the technical aspects through um, through planning, you know, certainly if you just look at the numbers, there are a lot more people here in support of it than the, the small number that are that are opposed. I think some of those have simply have some questions about what happens if um, a non-conforming duplex is in an RS zone. And my understanding is it is non-conforming, but they can redevelop as a duplex if they've got the the data to show that it, they're operating as a duplex. And I guess if somebody can confirm. That. that that's correct. The the way that uh, that it's written is that uh, if you show that you are a legal not uh, a legally conforming duplex at the time of the legislation, then the council lady has said that she'd honor that. And uh, but more to the point is that even after the down zoning, you'd be a legally non-conforming use, and you'd be able to continue operation. So, right. Yes. So y'all like y'all like pulling them out because it's neater for you, but it functionally it, it just. We, we like to pull them out because it adds a diversity of housing type for the area and that meets with some of our planning goals. And I appreciate that. Um, so that, that being said, I feel like, um, you know, we, we um, had some questions the last time. I feel like those questions have been diligently dealt with and answered and I support this. Um, yeah, I can appreciate all the work that's been done. Last time we saw this, we debated it for a long time. And I think um, at that time, my conclusion was that we needed something that everyone agreed in. And it looks like the majority of the people agree on this. So I think that's great. Um, and I think 
I know you guys, the staff has done a lot of work to try to get these, you know, the, the research done for duplexes and, um, I appreciate that. So I also support staff recommendation on this. Commissioner Clifton. Well, <clears throat> I am a little bit speechless because um, I always knew Councilwoman Murphy was thorough. <laughs> and I knew she probably realized I'd gone to Vanderbilt Law School and would probably find an old professor of mine to come here and speak. <laughs> but I did not realize she would pair that with someone who lived on Estes, a couple of houses from where my wife and I moved in 19... 77 when we got married in 838A mm -hmm. Estes, right on the banks of a raging creek, as I recall. So some, some, some serious work has been done in, in figuring out who ought to testify here today. <laughs> uh, I do believe in infill development. I believe in more density. Um, I believe there's lots of parts of this county that cry out for more density. Uh, and it's how, one way we will be able to accommodate more people and have more transit. I do not see Clearview <laughs> and similar streets as, as particularly good candidates for more density, and, and there's just not a real good case to be made that that's where density needs to happen. Uh, I think it's a great compromise to, to build in diversity by keeping the existing duplexes. We, we haven't done that everywhere. You and I have been part of conservation overlay areas where well, you know, we didn't opt anybody out when we could manage not to. Um, but this is this kind of serves several purposes by kind of having the, the diversity of housing types built into the rezoning. So I, I, I realize that some of the past confusion about this has been exactly who was eligible for what. But I think uh, for this kind of a fairly broad area, um, I think that those questions have been minimized. I think we know what we're voting on. I think this is not, these are not the streets that, that, that any of us really are thinking of when we think of the need for tremendous new density to make the city the city. Uh, so I plan to support a motion to approve. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lady, thank you for allowing the people to opt out. And uh, I think we're Gained a lot of ground on it. And I want to thank everybody that stayed here for five hours and you're very passionate about your pro your property rights and the character of the neighborhood and the willingness to give up probably some future profits. And it's very admirable. Um, and the houses that have opt out, um, I would hope that, I don't know whether we do it here or whether it's, I don't know how to do it, but. There should not be, if they build a duplex there, should not be any parking in the front of that house. They park in the front yard, but to the side of the driveway. But I think that character, that one thing really goes against the grain of what the character is of, of any neighborhood, generally. Um, I think there's still two properties that I'd like to get addressed. The two gentlemen that spoke, um, as to what their issues are, were they allowed to opt out? And, and I understand on the island, because we've had some correspondence on that, um, that right now, if you left at R10 and they split the lot, they could build four units there. And I'm, I'm convinced that that's not what they want to do. That they're, they're, they're not builders, they're wanting to live in that neighborhood. And I'm not sure how to get there, but whether it's they would agree to a deed restriction that there's only going to be if, if you make this R S ten that there's that they can subdivide that into two lots and build one single family and one single family which would be two, uh, whether that's through a deed restriction or whether it's agreement here or, or whatever, but I think we need to address that. And the other gentlemen's I'm not sure um, if he wants to state his again, but if you would address those two, I think then we're, I'm, I'm ready to, I think we've done an admirable job to get it to this point, but I think it's just those two that's still hanging out there that like to see 
some resolution would if you, we can. Would you let me do so? I've been back and forth with with them over the past couple weeks, um, and it's. I mean, I felt like we've had some miscommunications on on at first after first conversation I felt like we had after this, they were just gonna subdivide um, and, and move on. And then since then it has been, whether they want to, whether they not, I, I offered to uh, support an SP. I've offered to, if, if they're very, if they're concerned about the setback and the, the, their building space, you know, because if they, if they uh, subdivide and there are 10, then I believe it's a five foot setback on each. So it'd be at 10 feet apart where I think under, are 10, they'd be like, it's six to eight feet apart. Now, I, I could be totally off on those those figures, but I think the two HPRs can be like six or eight feet apart, right? So, I mean, that's really just a, a two, foot, two foot difference on those. I mean, I've, I said, would you be willing to do a deed restriction? All of those were kind of thrown out. And, and then this week, they I knew that they took the plat over and then, uh, Tonight, he told me that he's, you know, going to default on his on his loan. So it's, it, I, I felt like it was a two step forward, two step back. Um, you know, I've, I've said I could help in ways on those setbacks. Um, I think that if they are, if their plan is to build two on one lot on this lot that can be subdivided, I'm not sure what the. I'm not seeing the difference between the two. And I think that the staff really strongly recommends that it be left in because there is that possibility that something happens and they don't, um, they decide not to build the two single family homes and we end up with four there. Um, and then these neighbors are gonna be back up here and, mm. and you know, but, but if I don't know what else I can, I can offer to help with them on. Yeah. Hey, uh, if, Chairman, if, if I might, um, the, the correspondence that the chairman uh, mentioned just a moment ago, I think he uh, he may be mentioning an email that I sent out and I, and I copied the, the county lady, lady on. And uh, it, it was the, to Mike Nixon and the, just so that we've got the record clear and everybody and that's is. that's the island lot and not the one yeah. that yes. the gentleman spoke of. Uh, uh, yes, Commissioner, it's the, it's the island lot and uh, just to make, to put it in the record so that everybody has the same information. And what I, I wrote to him in the email was, I said, although it is ultimately the decision of the Planning Commission to permit the subdivision of property, I believe that an appropriate site plan can be developed to allow for two single family lots at this site. And I will support subdividing this lot into two single family lots when we are presented with an appropriate site plan. And, and I believe that from my discussions with the council lady, and not to put words in her mouth, but I believe that that's her understanding as well. And I, and I sent that email to him so that he, he had at least that assurance that we, were, we want to work with him. Uh, but that we don't, uh, that, that the planning department does not believe that four uh, homes on that lot is appropriate, but that we do see that there could be two single families there and that we will continue to work with them to do that. And, and he did uh, send us a site plan uh, and, you know, the uh, devil's in the details. Uh, that site plan uh, needs some work. We need to make sure that uh, we deal with some other issues like the requirements for sidewalks and, and how we would deal with that. And he's, he's received a correspondence from us on that as well about trying to uh, minimize that requirement because uh, a strict um, application of that would require a sidewalk in a circle all the way around that property, which would be extraordinarily expensive and and not really serve much of a purpose at all. Uh, and so, so we have tried to give assurances where we can. And as, but as I stated at the beginning of that correspondence, ultimately that's that's uh, up to this body to make that decision. And I think you're in agreement that if there's just two single-family houses, that you can support that. But, mm -hmm. And I understand. If they subdivided it and left it at R10, they could build two oh. on each lot, and that's. Yes, sir. I'm and not in favor of that, you know. So. Right, and uh, I I know that there have been not. some discussion about like this sidewalk and lieu payment, and that's not something that I want to make any commitment or promise to because it's mm -hmm. not something I've calculated or known or. That's not my realm, right? <laughs> I don't know, if, I don't know if, that if realm. Built, so. Your information: if they built two on there, two single family today, they could be within six feet of each other. Um, uh, but if they subdivide 
with the property line, then it'd be 10 feet. So they'd be further apart by subdividing it. Um, Bill Herbert has been very patient trying to explain that to me and, and the fact that it has to do with uh, like how many windows are between the walls or something. Um, and I get confused every time. It's a fire issue. So fire yes, issue. and he, yeah. he tries his best and I just still can't count windows and inches. Um, well, rest so assured, <laughs> if, they, if they subdivide it in two lots, it'll be 10 foot apart. I, it's my understanding it would be they would have the setback that you have and it would be uh, 10 feet on the side and okay. whatever on the, the back, 10, 20, whatever, uh, but it's 10 on the sides. So I would, I would, I don't want to speak without Bill Herbert telling me exactly how many <laughs> windows they would need to be six feet okay. or something. And I would hope that Mr. Nixon has heard enough here of support that he's convinced that, that everybody's wanting to help him and that uh, we will help him and you know, as long as the plot plan comes in and the, the setbacks are, are okay. The other gentleman, what you addressed, what his issue was. To, that spoke tonight, or? The, la the last gentleman that spoke. He wanted to find yeah, he, um, we, he spoke, we spoke briefly before and he said that he, he, and I think he said it up here too, is that he understands the down zoning and I believe he said he supports it on Clearview and Crescent and maybe not on Estes. And so I asked him if he wanted to be opted out, but of course that would, um, like I've said to the other one or two that I've gotten is that so we he, can't he, make it on this map, but it's something that we can accommodate once we get to council. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Hens? He asked all my questions. Okay. I'm in good shape. Thank you. Commissioner Hagen, there. I like going last. I'm good. Thank you. You're not last. No. Commissioner <laughs> Tibbs. <laughs> I didn't mean last. At the end, towards the end. The best right. for last. I'd like to make a motion to approve okay. based on staff recommendation. Okay. And I think we all want to just note um, how much we appreciate the, what the council lady has done. Having sat through this for a long time last time, it's really nice to see this process work out mostly for everybody's best interest. So thank you, and thank you for, for working with us to make this happen. So with that, um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? Oh, yeah, any opposed? Thank you. Okay, we have a few more items, so if you guys can let our minor items, but let us get through. <laughs> Report from Historic. <laughs> oh, House Fair on March 4th. If you guys, hello. <laughs> and don't forget about the um, African American History and Culture Conference that starts tomorrow, February 10th. Right. Oh, wait, wait. And what was that? Old House Fair. Old House Fair, March 4th. Old House Fair, March 4th. Okay. Uh, Parks Committee. Yeah, so on Monday, the 13th, um, the plan to play draft will be public at the Nashville Public Library. Mayor Barry will be announcing it, or there, and um, it's open to the public on noon, so if anybody wants to go. Okay, thank you. Um, I, we do not have anything from the Executive Committee. Um, Council Lady? I'm sure you have good stuff. I'll say two things real briefly. One, we uh, we just voted on a the first um, big allocation from the Barnes Fund for um, affordable housing in three different areas, and it's just exciting to see that piece start to fall into place. We're continuing to work on other facets now of the many of that grid of different parts of that solution that we have to work on. So that committee is back at work. Um, and you may or may not be aware that short-term rental continues to be a topic of interest. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so there will be some new bills coming through. You may see them in another week or two. Great, at thank you. Yeah. At every level of government. And it, that, that would actually be one of the things that I would want to point out is that we're seeing state legislation being filed both uh, in regards to short-term rental and uh, affordable housing. Now, we'll see how they work their way through committee, uh, but they are clearly targeted towards the policies that the, the council has enacted. 
Thank and, you. And, and I'm not in support. Do you have any more um, happy news for us tonight <laughs> <laughs> to end this night? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, and I've already announced earlier, but Catherine okay. Withers has uh, put in her uh, notice, but not written notice, so technically it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> we can that, still that, <laughs> that, that she'll be leaving us uh, at the beginning of March. Which agenda will that be on for us to consider? <laughs> uh, well, and, and, and while I'm, at, I'm also, we're in the middle of doing our capital improvements budget and our operating budget and going through that, that process. Uh, we have had unprecedented cooperation with the departments in turning uh, their long range plans into us and working with us through the capital improvements budget. It's, it's very exciting because it's a very different way that we're doing it. Uh, and, and this body, more than any, will see uh, the fruits of all that labor and also, as you know, that we've set a special meeting uh, to go through the capital improvements budget and that we'll work with each of you as we work up to that date. Uh, I know that in many years past you've received it with short notice and it's moved through here very quickly, but you're going to get a detailed report. Uh, the like that you have never seen before on every one of those items. And April 20th uh, is the date of the special meeting, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, also, I would say that for our department, uh, the turnover, I know that it has not gone unnoticed by this department, right, Brenda? Uh, <laughs> and, and so one of the things that I've talked to council about is that uh, this, uh, this department just has an inherent high rate of turnover and that has to do with the fact that we hire mostly graduate students that uh, understand land development but they come and work for us and they get a, a uh, level of knowledge and a, uh, both of development but a process as well that makes them highly sought after in the in the private sector and that's not going to change uh, and it shouldn't change uh, and so what we've got to do is, is what I've explained to the council members we've got to do a, uh, continue to do a good job of recruiting and some of the things that I'm asking for this year in our budget is going to be additional funding for continued education uh, because I think it's important that our staff knows that that we're as dedicated to their career as they are to their job here and I think that's a big piece in recruiting and then also uh, something I'm going to continue to, to uh, try to get through the council and through the uh, Civil Service Commission is portable benefits, uh, uh, retirement benefits. Right now, uh, when we're doing our recruiting and I'm explaining to somebody, well, if you stick around for 10 years, uh, you'll vest. Uh, it's a hard thing to sell to somebody that probably hasn't done anything other than live with their parents for 10 years. Uh, and so the idea of having something where there's a 401k where we do some sort of matching instead of just a pension, I think uh, would be another tool that we could use to, to, to do better recruiting. Uh, across the board. I think this river the past 10 years, you're, you're recruiting 10 year olds? <laughs> that, that, that's it, that's it. We may have to if we can get them to stay for a longer period of time and start recruiting at 10. Uh, but those are a couple of, of things that I'm going to push forward through this budget uh, and hopefully get the support of the council member uh, when, when, when we appear in front of the council. Thanks. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Any any other discussion? Any other items? Then we are adjourned. Is there a small chance down there? This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.